Matt, Matt Shears of Algarve Hypnotherapy, thanks for joining me on Algarve Amplified. Really appreciate you coming on. Thanks, man. It's great to be here. And great yeah. to see you. I always enjoy our conversations. Yeah, so, so we've, we've got a very, uh, a very close relationship now over the past few months in, in Algarve, which started um, with me coming to see you help me resolve my uh, issue with smoking, smoking cigarettes. And right. I came to see you. We did some hypnosis and a lot of other things. Yeah. And it worked, you know, obviously. worked first time. Yeah. And um, really thankful and grateful for that. But you know, that was just the beginning of, of our you know, friendship that we've developed over that period. And you've been a great influence on me and the things you've educated me upon. And, and I thank you for that. And so I just thought you'd be a fantastic guest to come on and talk about one of my favorite subjects, one of my favorite topics, and has been for a long time since I was 18, right. which is hypnosis and NLP. Right. Now, I've been looking at this for a long time, and um, it's still difficult to find a definition of what either is. So I'm going to put you on the spot now and ask <laughs> you, Matt, what is hypnosis? Right. Well, before I answer that, all of those things, as we say down here in the Algarve, Eagle Mint, in terms of same, same back, all those nice things you said about me, I can say... All those things back to you. It's been great to get to know you, and uh, I look forward to more and more of getting to know yous cool. in the future. But yeah, in terms of, um, it's a great question, and I was actually I was hoping you might be able to tell me. <laughs> there is a there's, there are two great words, and one thing uh, I've learned over the last. I suppose I've been learning it over a long, long time, right? So I'm fifty. Uh, and formally, when I got involved with studying hypnosis and neuro-linguistic programs, they're great programming, they're great words. What does it mean? What, what is hypnosis? Now, many, many people that have been involved with it a lot longer than I have, and far more intelligent people than I have, been grappling with that question. I've read lots of different interpretations, subjective interpretations of that word. So you ask me what I currently believe that means there are a couple of words a couple of uh, what they um, what they called um, a couple of things we have to accept as givens maybe and a couple of and some terminology that I'm I use and you're probably aware of a lot of it but if you're not let me just tell me to back up what it means there's a word that we use a lot called rapport now, rapport is a, what does that mean? That's a little bit easier to define. It's a state of unconscious connection mm. that you can have with yourself or with someone else. Uh, an unconscious connection is one simply defined, I guess, without verbal communication, without words. So an idea of that is <clears throat> sometimes you're out with... I quite like people watching, you know, you're out in a bar or a restaurant with your wife or your mates or whatever and you just so up your attention wanders and you might see a couple of people sitting on another table and their physiology, their posture is exactly the same. You know, when, they, when one leans in, the other one leans back and when the other one leans back, the other one leans in and da, 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 da. The hands are doing the gesticulating the same. Sometimes people are even dressing the same and their facial expressions are the same. Now, this is something that quite often, unless you're trained in these things, you're not aware is happening mirroring someone you've probably heard of that you know mm -hmm. people talk about it i think it was quite a big deal back when i was a kid about mirroring someone in an interview and so macroscopic movements big movements if someone is sitting there if i was to mirror you now you know oh, okay i'd nod my head the same and i'd put my hands the same da, 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 da. that's macroscopic mirroring. sometimes be obvious right so nevertheless there's some part of our understanding that picks up without any words being exchanged that someone is quite literally speaking my language without speaking so uh, the the tone of voice well okay let's take the voice out of it the way you swallow the way you breathe the way you might scratch your head la -di -da -di -da -di -da. unconscious rapport is when that connection is undeniably present but you're not consciously aware of it you can be in rapport with yourself and i and i like to think if you're in rapport with yourself some part of you would give you a suggestion you know, I think it's probably a good idea to go out and, have, and celebrate so-and-so's birthday. You know, your co a conscious voice says that to yourself. And you might go, no way, I hate that guy. I've never learned... Nah, nah, nah. And there's another part of you who goes, you know what, that's not true. You've actually had a long relationship with that guy and he means something to you. And then you kind of mellow out and you feel yourself kind of relaxing a bit. And you listen to a voice that's coming on inside of you and you know it's the right thing. 
So that in somehow rapport, congruency, when your body is doing what your words are doing and they match, you're in sync with yourself or other people. I believe, therefore, it's a long way round to describe when you're in rapport, hypnosis can be described, and I tend to believe this is the best description for me at the moment, is a state of special uh, unconscious awareness between the hypnotist mm -hmm. and the client or the person that they're talking to. So in a lot of sense, every communication is a hypnotic one if, it is, if we are both getting what we want mm. from the communication. Well, well, that, well that's, that made me think as you were talking that this is a hypnotic exactly situation, right. isn't exactly it? Exactly I mean, right. This whole, even this whole podcast idea that's right. of the host talking to a guest, I mean, there has to be some rapport in order for the podcast to, maybe there doesn't need to be rapport, but I just thought about that then as you were talking that this has got an element of, of that. Of hypnosis. Now, what? so the word itself is, you know, the Greek god of sleep, hypno, mm. uh, back in the day, late 1700s, early 1800s, when that t uh, phrase was coined by, who was it now? Um, it wasn't Mesmer, he was the first guy. But I was thinking about this, every act of effective, concise communication between two individuals or a group of individuals and hundreds of thousands of other individuals mm. that is meaningful, that contains metaphor and a message that is ingrained deeply within the people that are listening to it. Could you say metaphor? Why is that important to the, to the rapport? I think metaphor, well, it's a fact. A metaphor is a, is a fancy, fancy word, really, for a story. Yeah. So everything in life is a metaphor. So this, what you just said, this podcast, this idea of a podcast, mm. is a metaphor. Mm. So it's basically, a, what is it a metaphor for? Mm. It's the idea of sitting down and talking to someone about something they're in, that, that they know about or they enjoy to have a learning from them. Now, we, that metaphorically can be described throughout our whole life. So a story, a metaphor is something that has happened in our life before. There has been times in your life when someone has sat you down and told you a story that you've learnt from, that you've then taken all the way through your life to explain certain contexts that you're in, for example, now. All of a sudden you was like, it came to me as we were talking, this whole yeah. thing about, it's a, that's a metaphor. These words, I mean, the further we get into talking about this subject, the words are only, they only mean what we, the meaning we assign them subjectively. Mm -hmm. So the idea of a hypnotic trance, I quite often, I'd, and I'll, I'll ask you the question, mm. Where is there any evidence in the world to suggest that there is anything else but hypnotic trances? States of trance from one that we go in to the, to the other. We're going into different states of trance, which could be described as a collection of behaviours within a certain state. Right. Altered, altered states of consciousness yeah. is another word. So, you know, before you came down here this morning, I know you're a family man, you were in a certain trance where you had to do things to facilitate the morning yeah. being done. And a it's routine. A, a routine. Yeah. And it's a very different state of consciousness as to the one you were in now, as to the one you might be in later, and to the one you were in, da 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 da, da whenever. So that something is going, okay, almost like imagine seeing a chessboard from a, from a planned view, looking down at those chessboards. Some, it's, it seems as though, mm. esoterically, so, something is, you could, cause a tr you could call the trance or the altered state the movement of one of those pieces, but all of those pieces are ours. Right, so something, and it's not external in this case, that used to people, wasn't it the Greeks that used to think, you know, the, ch the chessboard yeah. that they were controlling was... Well, used to watch it as like kids. Clash of the Titans. Jason and, so, and the Argonauts. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's some, at that point you go, okay, I think we got to the point now in our evolution or whatever it is that we go, okay, that is probably not happening. So who is moving our pieces around on that board to, for us to go in and out of those squares or those trances or those routines? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I choose to believe... We are the people, we, part of us, part of our brain is the one that is doing that movement. And there is a way uh, through learning about this thing called hypnosis and this other thing called neuro-linguistic programming. And not only those ways, back in the day, like way, way back, all the way back to the shamans, you know, mm. they were 
getting in trance or altered states to communicate with good or bad spirits or whatever you want to call it. People still do that. They're still, with all due respect, there's people that go on television now in certain parts of the States and probably the rest of the world and say that they can cast out the devil in someone by touching their head as long as you spend $3,000 in a donation. You know, that's a trance as well. And a lot of those people are in that trance with them and they believe it. Mm. Is it real? It's, it's subjective. Well, if, if, if they believe it and they get the result, it works. That's right. Yeah. That is the bottom line, man. Yeah. That is the bottom line. So, but just to, just just to uh, hold up there a second. So, when you use the metaphor there of the chessboard, yeah, and that each each step on the chessboard is potentially a different state that you may have throughout the day. Right. right? So, step one is get up in the morning. Step two is make the breakfast. Step three is that's like your pawn moving. You're one, you know. moving pawn, right? Yeah. Now, now um, with hypnosis, maybe that we're doing those stages and steps instinctively. Well, we are because right. we've done them so many times. That's right. But, but but we can create bad habits within those Absolutely. steps and states, and there's a lack of intentionality right. through those steps of behaviors. Right. Would you say that hypnosis and NLP kind of unlocks the human operating system so that we can uh, have intentionality about each of those squares on the chessboard that you use as a wonderful a great metaphor? Wonderful metaphor, right yeah. back at me. <laughs> For, I mean, of course, my answer it's is a war that. of metaphors. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> it's an absolute. What else? So in some sense, to paraphrase you, something that you can prevent making bad moves. Yeah. Now, you know, of course, sometimes the bad moves unlock a whole, you know, like a lucky accident can yeah. unlock a whole uh, couple of decades of your life mm -hmm. like it did for me coming here. There's another story mm -hmm. we may or may not cover. Yeah. But absolutely right. To be able to, 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 be able to think a minute, to step back a minute and think, if uh, all of these moves that I have in my life up to this point are metaphorically explained from my personal history. I also have, a, there's nothing to suggest that I don't have a limitless ability to learn perfect moves mm. for, for any context I may or may not find myself in. So what I find interesting, more interesting than the idea of what does hip, what, it, what is hypnosis, because that realistically is a, a very, very difficult question. Mm. Uh, because it is subjective as well. But, the, but the, I, I find that you know immensely interesting. Yeah. The fact that you know the, the greatest <laughs> thinkers, yeah. uh, even within the field, still are yet to find a definitive yeah. uh, response to that question. Yeah. It's very subjective, and it's kind of how you interpret it, or you interpret the narrative or the metaphors yeah. that can have the effect upon you and change, you know, make change in B your life. Bingo. I mean, yeah. that that realistically there is a is a concise. Mm. Uh, explanation for hypnosis specifically for you yeah now uh, for me working as a hypnotist mm. um i i go through various different uh, uh, appointments where i'm sort of you know i'm being very professional and like okay but sometimes i want to jump up and down and go holy fucking what the fuck just happened <laughs> like <laughs> and so in some sense for me, sometimes I am continuously and will continuously be blown away by what is happening mm. with, if you want to call it hypnosis or NLP, what is causing the individual in front of me as a as an agent of change, mm. as we say. You I know. think it's a far more um, persuasive term, isn't it, an agent right. of change? Yeah. It, yeah, I mean, some people come and see me as, as a hypnotist yeah. because they've heard that that's what I do and I am a hypnotist. I'm like, I'm actually a... I'm actually other things as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't always a hypnotist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if some some people want to come and they want to experience a trance with me, and, and a lot of people have actually say, "Are you going to turn me into a toad, or have you got a pocket watch?" Mm. I'm actually thinking about getting a pocket watch. Yeah. Because you know the reasons why that is effective: the eye fixation, induction. It work. It does work. We will we will use it on ourselves, even if we don't know what we're doing. The the idea that everyone that comes has their own subjective interpretation of what it, hypnosis is and what NLP is. So I allow them, their metaphors to guide me in helping them make change in their life. It must be really fascinating for you because me as the subject or as the client, I, I witnessed the change in me, right? Which yeah. is profound enough. Right? Right. You know, wow, this is incredible though. You yeah. know, just listening or talking or about stories and you know uh, potent words that you may use can bring about profound personal behavioral change yeah. the things that have dogged you for decades right. can be done in an instant but 
that's one thing being the on the receiving end of that. But yeah. you get to see this change from an objective point of view, but for a number of different people. Amazing, yeah. Yeah, so, so you're actually witnessing this, you know, uh, these profound changes in people on a daily basis, mm -hmm. I, I guess. That which, I, uh, yeah. Which must be like a very um, persuasive argument for yourself in what you're doing. It is, but of course, in that sense, it makes it even more difficult. And to go back to one of the points you said about it, it what you thought about since you were a teenager, yeah. and that some of the leaders in the field are still struggling to find a definition of what this thing is. Mm. And I think for one of the reasons, when you are involved in it, like in the trenches, so to speak, doing it, yeah. not there's nothing wrong with someone's got to teach it, mm. but actually getting in there and dealing with people and helping people understand themselves and go, get over things, the more and more of that you are around, the more difficult it becomes for me to tie down what it is. Yeah. Right, so... Mercurial and nebulous. It's well, just, you know, I mean, like you it know, shifts. It's what it is from day to day. <laughs> is it is it magic? Yeah. Well, I'm not, I, I don't know. Is it something I'm doing? I don't know. Is it something the person that I'm talking to is doing? Absolutely. Are they magic? You know, these. It's, it's one of those things that you just keep undoing it forever. Yeah. And I think I hope to be lucky enough to be involved in it for the rest of my life. Well, I will be. Mm. To what capacity? Yet I'm. I'm not quite sure. At the moment having people uh, contact me in various states of trance where they will say things like, I can't stop smoking. I can't get on an aeroplane. Mm. I can't walk down the shop and I can't speak to that person. I'm unable to see a way through. I can't tune in to my wife or whatever it is. And these, there's lots of can'ts and in, in, there's classifications, those linguistic utterances mm -hmm have now been labelled in the work that they've done in NLP, which is useful. You don't have to know the names, of course. But the more I hear those things and the more I realise the people I'm speaking to are in a very deep trance, they're experiencing deep trance phenomena. So there is a thing in classic hypnosis training, they used to have levels of hypnotise, how hypnotised are you, you know? Mm. I don't know how many levels there were and the ultimate expression, the deepest level was when you could, uh, you know, cut someone's arm off and they wouldn't feel it, which is one of the guys, I think it was um, one of the uh, 1800, in terms of hypnosis as a thing as we know it now, more or less late 1700s and 1800s is when... What's his name? Mesmer. Mesmer. Francis Mesmer. Well, isn't that where Mesmerized comes That's from? That's where Mesmerized comes from. Someone's mesmerized, is the hypnotized by you. And he had a, you know, like his ideas were pretty cool, you know, pretty mind blowing where, yeah. you know, we've got this magnetism and you can treat Was the, it animal magnetism that he- He called it animal magnetism. Yeah. And you could, tr you could treat it by putting people in a bath with iron filings and, you know, it was a blockage of electromagnetic energy in the body. Mm. Now that was late 1700s, right? So the term- he was getting results, wasn't he? Even, well, he, he didn't know why. He didn't know what it yeah. was, but he was getting results. Results. Well, think yeah. about think about what has, what's been proved since then in terms of electromagnetic energy and mm -hmm. what actually that is. What everything. I mean, I, Albert Einstein, he was no slouch, right? right? So he was, you know, he was going. Everything's energy. We are energy. All matter vibrates at a certain frequency. But it's all energy, electromagnetic energy, or whatever you want to call it. Everything moves with a frequency. Mm -hmm. So this guy was going. Oh, okay. okay there's, if, if someone has this block, some blockage in their system whether it's physical or emotional or mental, which is no difference. But if there's, a, if there's an issue someone's got, it's because of there is a blockage of electromagnetic energy through their body. Mm -hmm. and, then you, and, and initially people laugh at that and go, animal magnetism, sitting in a bath full of iron filings, whatever. We've come a long way since then. But it's funny in terms of physics mm. and quantum science specifically, you can go, hmm, maybe, <laughs> maybe it was onto something. Maybe, but like things, they were just articulating their vision with the tools they had they at had, their disposal. There you go. Yeah. And and then the next guy that came along, I think it was James Braid. He's the he's the one that still is his inductions are still used today. Yeah, the eye fixation. He was yeah. an ophthalmologist, I believe. Yeah. And he the story is he was late for an appointment and he came in he came through his uh, waiting room and there was someone there. It was back in the day with gas lamps and someone was sitting there staring at a flame. And he's like, what? They didn't even notice me coming. They didn't hear me come in. Like, what's going on? Like, they, is, have they got carbon monoxide poisoning? I don't know what he thought. But then realised, I guess he had other interests. Maybe he'd heard about Mesmer's well, is that work. Where the, is that where the, the, the... That's where fixation comes from. From the braid induction? From the, the idea that he notes of someone staring at a candle. Yeah. 
That's very, no, very, very conducive to go into a, an altered state if you stare at the flame of a candle. Yeah, it's interesting, that, isn't it? What's yeah, well, like you're fit, um, but in, in the end, the, the pocket watch is basically eye fixation. That's what because that is, that is the most popular image yeah. of a hypnosis, and it has some connotations to it as well, doesn't it? It's not yeah. like it's a it's a positive image. It can carry some negative connotations as well. It's like you know the, the hypnotist has got you under control and you've right. lost your mind, and That's right. you know, this person is manipulating you to do things that you don't want to do. But yeah. you know, it's interesting where that comes from is from this idea of the eye induction and the flame. And, it, and it, allegedly, you know, how do we know it was? He's noticed this person was looked like they were. A, asleep with their eyes open so he just said close your eyes and the person shut their eyes and he went so that was hypnosis. go into deep sleep <laughs> and the person's head went and he was like oh no. yeah what? and then he you know being an eye an ophthalmologist and eye surgeon he was like okay what, what can i reproduce these results and he did mm. publish what he found and the idea of the eye fixation induction came from him uh and who was the next guy? A Elsdow, who was a surgeon. So, so, so that that's kind of a, a bit of a clue to mm. what hypnosis is, isn't it? In in that <clears throat> in that kind of a description of that action of staring at a flame can cause you to go into hypnotic right, so what, induction. So why yeah. why do you think that would be a clue, and why what do you think is going on when someone stares at something? Yeah. Specifically, uh, could they stare at the wall and have the same induction, or yeah. is it got to be something you moving? Of like you could stare at my finger. Yeah. You could stare at the top of a pen. You could stare at a line on the wall. You stare at anything. Fix, fixing your gaze on something. Mm. Is, is there something to do with that kind of um, l narrowing your focus? That's right. Yeah. You're, you're narrowing your focus and going more internal. And I think the, de the dictionary definition of hypnosis is something like ex uh, extreme relaxation with heightened awareness. Yeah. Now, we, we all get in those states with our eyes open. Mm -hmm. But if you then... Have asked someone to close their eyes, you've blocked out a lot of objective reality. A lot, you're, you're not seeing a lot of things that are around you. you so it's just sound. So you've t right, and you and you then have an opportunity with your eyes closed to imagine. I could ask you to close your eyes now, and so <laughs> I won't. <laughs> in my most hypnotic <laughs> tone. It's going to change this podcast immensely. Any moment. <laughs> but if, if if one is to close their eyes, and say, imagine. Imagine Matt is sitting in front of you, and what color is his watch strap? Mm. You know, you you have to go to a different state of re, of consciousness mm. to recall that information because it's no longer directly in front of you. But but I, I've been in I've been to many hypnotists over the years, been to hypnotist courses, and I know told the story about that in a short yep. while. But I love being in a deep hypnotic state, and I really let myself go. I think you know if I'm, if I'm here, I may as well go for it. I don't right. resist it because I want to experience it. Yeah. And then when you go into that deeply relaxed state, I mean, I, I can fidget. Right, but when I'm in a, a, a hypnotic, deep hypnotic trance, I can sit there for two hours and not move a muscle. Yeah. Right, and it's it's such a strange but really enjoyable experience, especially when you come out. Yeah. Right, you go, wow, I didn't want to come out of that. That yeah. was that was awesome. <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, so so that in itself, okay. So just by fixating on a spot, and then the hypnotist can you know take you into an eyes closed um, situation and then you can deeply deeply relax and, and yeah. you go into this state that you don't normally go into unless maybe you're sleeping yes right yeah you don't consciously uh, well we actually there seems to be stuck there well there is studies that seems to suggest that the way our brain as a machine works mm. i like to use the metaphor well, there are they are metaphors themselves conscious and unconscious mind right mm -hmm. so one thing we do understand you know you could put a hundred um, neurologists in the room what is the where's the mind mm. like, how do you know how can like, know. so let alone the, the unconscious mind but the metaphysics aren't you there's a whole uh, conversation there's a whole about another that. Yeah, there, we'll I, get to that, I read something I read something you know there is all, all this current exploration and study to suggest that oh okay the unconscious mind there is a lot of evidence to suggest that individual subject uh, unconscious minds are or is together the objective universe, the collective unconscious, <laughs> which, it, which gets pretty heavy. Like, yeah, well, that's good. We're I mean, all we're all some part of us is, is contributing to the to the observable universe and what we understand. But it, about in, it. in some ways, that's why I think 
right, some of the great materialist minds struggle to define yeah, hypnosis right. because they reach the edge of the material universe That's and right. are afraid to go beyond it because they don't want to be called a quack or yeah, they don't want yeah. to be called, you know, uh, a spiritualist or something. Yeah. But I think that's where the, the struggle lies at the moment is that we have to venture into the other, right, to ask questions of where we actually are going. What is really at play what is happening yeah because if if, you know we just take the scientific version well why can't we get a definition (laughs) but you're absolutely right Mm. i mean i think a great example of uh the evolution of what we understand these days as as hypnosis and hypnotherapy yeah you know if you take it from the guys we all come from the shamanism right so i've read a great book recently robert anton wilson book like what what a, what a great man what a great book cool. i can't wait to read more of them <laughs> really cool and he does a really nice uh, image of how he can trace the lineage according to him from shamanism and explain everything down to the most modern secret societies mm. <laughs> right and you read it and you and you read the book and you see this image and you think oh, this dude was uh, onto something mm. he didn't he didn't need to one of the great quotes i got from the book in the end he was like you know what i've what i've learned ultimately is that i don't believe in anything yeah you know so and that you that's kind of the study of hypnosis can kind of lead you to that position (laughs) you know what i mean like because everything's plastic what you want to believe in you snap into actuality into reality yeah everyone's got to believe so i often say to the people in my sessions at Mm. some point listen i'm we I'm making all this shit up. Like I'm that. making yeah. all this up. It's all bollocks. I'm yeah. just nobody knows anything. Yeah. Whatever we, whatever one chooses to believe is mm. their version of fact mm. is. So mm. I think that way I started to understand. Okay, from uh, what's his name from Mesmer to James Braid to the next guy who actually was a surgeon who'd done hundreds of operations with hypnosis people in altered states mm. without. Just the one in India. Yeah. Yeah, and it was, it was testicles and, oh, it was another one. I think he'd it? done hundreds of, or, or he cut, na- someone, no, cut someone's nails. arm off, he, he cut someone's leg off. Yeah. That, and there was lots of the, the, um, the uh, what they called, the board of physicians that mm. were watching the, because uh, he it was English. Um, well, but, 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 so, so, so we go into this from Braid, right? Braid gives us this idea that we can go into a relaxed, eyes closed, deep, deep, State go internal. of trends, go internal, yeah. right? And then once in that state, right. the hypnotist then has the power granted by the subject to the hypnotist because it's all consensual, you know, it's largely, I think, right? And then the hypnotist will make suggestions that yep. can have profound changes upon the subject, yes. which the next guy proves with pain management yes. and uh, recovery from surgery. The surgeon, a- 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 Earlsdale, James Earlsdale. Yeah. Now, he, absolutely right. Now, I would just retract one of those words okay, from the record. Yeah. I wouldn't say that, I wouldn't use power. The hypnotist does really not have the power. What the, ha- what the hypnotist does have mm. is the suggestion. Because if, no matter how deep someone is in a trance, mm. If a word or a group of words a, or a group of suggestions was offered is offered to someone mm. that directly f- like fundamentally violates yeah. their own deeply held values and beliefs, mm. no matter how deep you are in a trance, that will that those suggestions will be rejected. Well, all hypnosis is self hypnosis. That's right. Yeah. So if if you can be bothered to. Uh, observe a group of people for long enough and, and maybe find the propensity to be somnambulistic, which is a great word, just which means to, to go somnambulistic. into trance. Somnambulistic. Somnambulistic. You're a somnambulistic. Somnambulism. <laughs> somnambulism. If you are likely to respond to suggestions quickly, mm. then if you can be bothered and for some reason you want to find out who that who those group of people are, then you can find that most of the suggestions that you're going to offer them will be accepted very quickly. That's where you have the shock or the rapid inductions, three, two, one, sleep kind of things. So, uh, so you know, is the hypnotist in the process of inducting the subject into an uh, altered state, hmm. are they looking for the signs of how suggestible the subject That's is? That's right, yeah. yeah. And then when you feel as if, okay, this... They're ready to, to, to receive the suggestion. Yeah. That's when you go in. Well, that's exactly right. With yeah. stage hypnosis specifically, 
there's all you know there's usually like okay you go uh, to see a stage hypnotist you've already bought your ticket you've got the interest there's some compliance there this will be fun or this will be whatever but you've already suggested your willingness to take part by buy, buying the ticket mm. you're then in the in the auditorium everyone there's a lot of energy palette you can feel the energy everyone's going holy fuck what's going to happen who's going to turn into a stripper tonight and blah, 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 whatever and the dude comes on and he does whatever he's going to do and then he asks people to come up mm. to stage now if, if you and i go there and we're like i don't want to go up there yeah first of all you're like well what are you here for why did you buy the ticket? Why are you there? You're interested in this. If you're not interested in these concepts one way or another, you're more or less not alive. Yeah. So if you then put your hand up, and let's say there's 10 people, I think it's something like three out of every 10 are, som are somnoballistic, go into trance very easily. Mm -hmm. if, if you sometimes see, or you always see it, in some shape or form. Okay, what's your name? Okay, well, do me a favor, will you just stand there for me? Okay. Oh, actually, no, can you just move your chair and can you just put your, do you just want to, can you just scratch your head for me? I just want to see something. The more someone is willing to do what you ask them to do straight away, mm. the bigger indication they are also going to then go, well, if they've moved their chair, if they're going to move places, if they're going to stand forward, if they're going to say, can you make the noise of a frog on mic in front of people? They're going to they're gonna do my next suggestion. They've taken three. Mm. Which is quite, it's got quite profound implications yeah. if the person who is making those suggestions is not a stage hypnotist, That's but right. is actually a government. That's right. <laughs> you know? now, if, now, the reason why I said if you can be bothered, if, mm. if you are, you know, a lot of people have asked me in the past, can you, can you program someone to kill someone? Mm. And you're like, well... <laughs> Of course you can, yeah. Well, it's, it's the it's the um, what's it called the MK Ultra right uh, program that the CIA had. But that's how they they would create killers, but they would have to put them through trauma based right. trance. Right. So they'd give them trauma, and the the mind would forget that trauma right. because it wanted to you know be healthy and stuff. But they would have triggers that would you know, get them to relive the trauma and whatever suggestion was put right. into that. It's called MK Ultra. It's a classic conspiracy, you know. Well, uh, and, well yeah. the thing is, from my experience, mm. right, <laughs> the question for me, of course, isn't useful to say, can I make someone kill someone? Yeah. You know? <laughs> but uh, as we're talking about it, if you can be bothered and you are mm. the armed forces, guess what? Mm. You've got an, in, an almost inexhaustible supply of people that are more likely to have the desire to kill someone. Well, basic training is about breaking them down and rebuilding them. Right. That's what the drill sergeant's That's job is. That's your job. Isn't You're a soldier. It? So is, is that a form of hypnosis? For, well, for sure it is. Yeah. And also, like, I respect everyone that's in the armed forces, yeah. you know, but, but I know that I am not that kind of person. I, if I had to fight, you know, I'd, I'd do my best with a gun, but I'm not someone that's like, I want to join the army because mm. I want to be, a, I want to see, I wanna, I'm a fighter. I yeah, so go. you've already consented to that, haven't you, by joining and volunteering that's in right. the first place, yeah? Like you've consented to go, going on the stage with the stage hypnotist. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So, yeah. it, so the more you go, mm. all of a sudden you've got all of these people that you're like, well, we know, not all of them, because mm. sometimes, but a, a mass, 75% of them are all here because they they wouldn't have a problem with defending their country which ultimately means to kill someone so if you've got people that are physical specimens that do very well and they then display through their training specifics other psychological traits mm. well, this person could could we could maybe get this person and put them in the special forces or put them in a mm. behind enemy lines and do x y and z and then you get this whole debate of is there such thing as can you turn a behavior on in someone like with MK Ultra? Mm. Now, the reason why I don't think that's a stretch to consider mm. is because when people come to see me, they have a belief that they can't do something. Mm. A case in point pops into my mind recently, a young, a young girl was on holiday with her family that uh, her mum took her to hospital <clears throat> after the fact because she was doing her exams. She had about seven or eight exams to do. She'd done the first two and spent most of the time in the bathroom in England throwing up. Incredible panic attacks almost deliberate and couldn't do the exams. She wants to be a doctor, this, late, this girl. So they came on holiday and for some reason the mother ended, to, ended up, the, the panic attacks continued to the first day of their holiday. For some reason, now I never got to the bottom of why she decided to look for a hypnotist, hmm. but she did. Maybe she must have had experience with it herself or someone might have suggested. So the, the, late, the girl come to see me. Uh, now, she had a belief that she couldn't go back to England and do the rest of these six other exams without passing out, throwing up before she passed out, et cetera, et cetera. What am I going to do? Like, we'd done whatever we were going to do. 
And I said to her, let me know when you go back how you get on. Her mother and her sent me emails going, just, just blazed them. No oh. problem. <laughs> like all eight of them. Mm. No worries. Different person, different girl, don't know what happened. I don't need to profess to understand. I know, I know what, what happened either. What the problem either. is, yeah, yeah. I don't need to understand what happened. But there was something inside of her that already knew she could do those exams without throwing up and fainting and doing all the rest of it. I didn't put it there. Mm. So in some sense, it's a metaphor for the, ki for the killer in the army. Mm. There's something inside of a person that knows they can do something. Yeah. And with language, with hypnosis and NLP, basically are about language, right? With the language that they are using in their own internal auditory, and the language that I can pick up that they're using, that I can use back on them, I give them an option and, let, and help them rediscover what they already know. Mm. What that is called, I don't know. I've forgot, I've stopped trying to understand it and just are grateful that I'm involved in it. Mm. Because I, but I thought that was that was really impressive about your approach. When we had some sessions, it was like, I'm not really interested in the the causes yeah. or, or the, <clears throat> the deep psychological issues and stuff. It's more about okay, can we use these tools to fix it? Yeah, right. <laughs> that, yeah. And that for me was like quite profound, and yeah. and that actually broke through the the, the pattern. That was a pattern interrupt in yeah. itself. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, let's just let's just do it. And it, it's if the results you get the result, then it's worked. And why do you need to uncover all that back? Or, or even go down them paths that you may not really want to go down? Well, the understanding, I was saying this to someone the other day, under, does understanding something ever really, is it ever really helpful? <laughs> mm. Now, I don't know, it seems like a ridiculous <laughs> question to ask, but the more you understand something, mm. does it change the fact of what you can do with the thing? Now, mm. in some contexts, I suppose, well, even at the most deeply scientific understanding of that statement like people say if you if you suggest that you understand quantum mechanics it's a clear indication you do not yeah but that, that because isn't that the definition of quantum mechanics there is no definition because <laughs> as you look at something it moves or as you try to define it it changes right so you need to understand the parameters you're working in the algebra yeah. and the differential calculus etc those are the tools but understanding what is going on is not useful and in some sense displays that you really don't, you really don't get it. Yeah, I'm, I nearly said don't understand, understand it. <laughs> that you really don't get it. So if I'm in the I'm in the uh, school of thought that letting go of that conscious need to understand, and being familiar enough with the tools that you have at your disposal, which ultimately are all language. Mm. No, there's no magic here. There's no electric shocks. Well, but it's it's funny you should say that's just triggered a memory for me too. Is that language, right? Is the most persuasive important part of our experience i think and has the most profound effect upon our behavior and mental state right. and listening to other people's language yep. for instance when you're in the uk you are subject to all of the propaganda from the corporations trying to sell you things to the politicians trying to get you to vote for them it's a constant yeah. barrage yeah. of narrative-based metaphors in order to persuade you to do something <laughs> or to get you to have an emotional reaction to their language, to their linguistic... To program, take action. To yeah. their linguistic program, to take action that they want you to do, that they're trying to get you to consent, to scratch your face, right. scratch your nose, ultimately put the X on the box. That's right. right. But when I come here, I'm no longer subject to the UK propaganda because I'm not in that, uh, in, in that jurisdiction anymore. It yeah. doesn't come into my field. Yeah. So therefore, that can no longer influence me as much as it did. It can no longer have the emotional um, reactions to that information because it's gone from my field of view. But And in Portugal, because I don't speak the language. That's, that's the reason. The language doesn't affect me. It's still, it, it's <laughs> so I've still there. It, yeah, so I'm, I'm like, maybe I shouldn't learn Portuguese because all of a sudden I'm going to be Fair affected. Right. I'm going to be affected by the linguistic programming of the state, the corporation, the banks, everyone else who wants me to do things I don't want to do. You, you know, that is so true. Mm. You've got a simple, the way I would, okay, there's a code, a specific code that we have, that we learn mm. as native speakers of a language. So we have the codec 
yeah. to de-scramble these vocalizations, these words mm. of, a, of, a nat of native speakers of a language. When you have another set of codex or another code that you, will, you, you know how to de-scramble a different set of vocalizations, another language, it's the same voice box. Yeah. Realistically, it's the same, it's the same wavelength of sound, but they're in a different order of tonality yeah. and the interval pitch between the rhythm and all the rest of it. But if, so if you've got all of that information, if we're sitting here talking about what is hypnosis, what is NLP, how, can we, how, how does it help someone make a decision mm -hmm. or make a change? If we're doing that, you know, you know without a doubt the people that are responsible for governing countries and selling things to people, I've, I've, I've been doing it for decades. 100%, and they are armed with those tools, and generally the, popu the, the general population is ignorant it, is, uh, is of those tools, so we don't have a shield. That's right. So we don't have a shield to defend against that <clears throat> level of uh, manipulation. We, uh, well, we become in yeah. deep rapport yeah. with the government, yeah. even in a way where you go, when people are effing and blinding and about Tory or about Labour or of Conservative or about this and that. Who is it that said it doesn't it really Whoever you vote for, the, the government, government always wins. wins. But people get uh -huh. people fight each other and fall out. That's crazy. That's that's called hypnosis. Yeah. That's called a special state of conscious, unconscious rapport where the you don't realise what you don't realise. Mm. So uh, understanding, of course, about how you can be very easily manipulated if you don't know them tools if even and even if you don't even if you're not aware that there are tools to prevent you from being manipulated yeah if there's one thing that anyone watches this might take from it is to go how is it that i'm allowing other people's vocal utterances mm. to affect me and why am i choosing to, to let that happen why do we do that well, so, so for instance, a sh uh, um, your mother yeah. um, uh, has uh, an ability to affect your emotional state, I guess, a lot easier than a stranger, hmm. right? So it's not necessarily the, um, the, the, the code that's being um, projected to you. It's hmm. who's projecting the code yeah. or what's the context behind it, isn't it? it was, well, I think the, in terms of you know, what they call them anchors, a, sp a specific emotional a memory so what what's an emotion you know really to break the words down into what is happening when you experience an emotion so in terms of the five senses that we have mm. i like to refer to us as very sophisticated ai robots mm. we are we're machines mm. we need energy and we have elect and we run on electricity we we, ha we have a certain amount of food and the sunlight to give us energy ele electrical uh, impulses in our brain so we're a machine mm. what senses do we have to experience this objective reality that we live in. We have five senses only, what we see, what we hear, what we feel, what we taste and what we smell. That, they're our sensory capa capabilities. So if someone, like your mother, of course, or your father or your sister or your nan or your granddad, has a certain way of saying something to you mm. when you're a child and a certain way they look when they say it, that is not being picked up by your conscious mind because most communication is, is received and processed unconsciously. So the physiology, the, the tonality, the, the muscle tension in the face, the volume of the voice, all of those things are what the brain remembers. That gives you what is we refer to as an emotion, an, emotion, an emotional memory. Mm. So what, what could be an emotion in a machine? if you try to define it. So you think, okay, if I'm hearing a voice... But is that not what defines a machine from a human? There's the emotion, which is this kind of ether that we can't... Def what is it? You know, well, is, I, think, is, I think it's... Is this a spiritual energy? You know, mm. that is... So it's in the word emotion. Right, it's motion. It's moving. It's moving us, isn't it? Yeah. Whether it's moving us... It's moving us emotionally. And, and the, and the question know? is... Specifically how. Yeah, specifically how, yeah. And I, I believe consciousness can be defined quite simply. Mm. <laughs> That's a massive statement. <laughs> I don't, but in, in this sense... You can define like, consciousness but not hypnosis. Yeah, not hypnosis. <laughs> to, to me, it seems consciousness is an ability to do an, an immeasurable amount of computations um, with no time. Mm. So to, to make a decision 
based on all of your personal history, should I cross the road in front of that speeding ambulance? Right, there, there is, it, it, it makes the speed of light seem slow. Mm. We go through how many computations to realize that's not, no, that's not a good idea. All the evidence in my world suggests that if I do that, I'll die or I'll be very badly hurt. Now, if you've got a machine that can make so many computations of possible outcomes instantaneously, is that consciousness? Well, this is what we're on the threshold of at the moment is trying to determine whether AI can reach the singularity and become consciousness in and of itself. But I'm not so sure. I don't think God will not be mocked in my view, right? <laughs> and, and it's like AI is getting to the point now where what they're finding is, is that once it starts trying to replicate itself, mm. it becomes derivative and the results become less. It can only really work when it's got human input. Right. Well, I mean, so I'll, so we might have even reached peak AI al already. I you know? doubt it. Yeah. Okay. Because <laughs> I, I personally, I believe mm. we will. We are the most tremendous, majestic computational yeah. device known in the in the universe. Mm -hmm. our, our brain. Mm -hmm. Sooner or later. Well, I don't know. Maybe there's you know Einstein's cosmic speed limit. Maybe there is some kind of cosmic no one will ever be capable of more computations than the human mind. Mm. I don't know, maybe. But in terms of if you've got a machine that can make immeasurable amounts of calculations based on not only its personal experience, but all of the other life forms like it, mm. that all can communicate with each other, because we do. But we have archetypes as well, don't we, which, which kind of save um, computational power. Right. Right, because it's an archetype that we know, we recognize, right. we know how to behave within that archetype. Right. Like the mother is an archetype. That's right. You know? And with and with that set of to get back to your point, to yeah. get back to the to the set of anchors that can set off inside of us an emotion or a memory, an internal kinesthetic hallucination. Yeah. It's a great <laughs> okay. it's a mouthful. Okay. Right. An internal kinesthetic hallucination. Okay, so give us give us give us a metaphor for that. Give us an, an example of what that might mean in so real. So if life. we've got inter we've got visual auditory and kinesthetic the kinesthetic is the feeling. I can feel afraid, I can feel sad. Mm. I can feel that's hard and I can feel that soft. Yeah, but the important part of that phrase was hallucination. The hallucination is because we have we know that we have the external evidence of visual kinesthetic and auditory but we also have them internally right we hear things in our head we don't really mm. our brain deals with zeros and ones yeah yeah really good we don't see things we 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 do i just got a flash of my mum mm. uh, you didn't really it was the zeros and ones in the frontal cortex in the visual part of your cortex of your brain that you then labeled with words which is a separate thing your mum and I heard my mum's voice again you didn't and then I got a feeling what did I what feeling was it like so the process questions are important what was the feeling you got when you thought about your mum oh I got this I don't know I got depends on who your mum is but like I got this <laughs> I got this I got this feeling of like I got this feeling in my stomach like well again you you didn't really your stomach didn't actually go and turn into the size of a golf ball mm. it's the way you've internally dealt with that so when I say hallucinations they're not it's not happening really. Mm. It's hallucinatory. Mm. We, we use the language, which is secondary from the experience, the language, the labeling, the linguistics. And when you said how important communication is digitally, of course it is, especially in our own mind. If I didn't have any experience of what that feeling was and I didn't have any words to actually label it, of, oh, that's what happens when I see my mum, what would I do? I would have no way of... That's a signal, right? Mm. That's a signal being sent from my unconscious mind that I've labelled to me in this context. Now, we're getting signals all the time sent from us. Mm. They're hallucinatory in the sense that you, we don't see as far as I know, and I've said this to someone, maybe one day if someone can go, OK, do you know what, Matt? You're full, you're full of shit and you're wrong. We want to drill a tiny hole in someone's frontal cortex of their, in the visual part of their you brain. You should do that trappening. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and actually project it out on screen. Yeah. Yeah. And think of a dog. And then we've got sophisticated diodes and electrodes that go boom and a dog appears. I can't, I don't imagine that happening. What I can imagine is a load of zeros and ones binary information that is, code, it is coded in, in hallucinations in a way that we can consciously understand what they mean. Mm. So... Uh, 
kinesthetic feeling internal hallucination. Well, well, well I think um, <laughs> they, they kind of, we went off on a bit of a tangent there, but a fantastic one. But <laughs> if I can pull it back to the guy after Braid, I yeah. didn't get his name. Yeah, uh, Ersdale, the Ers surgeon. Ersdale, right. But I think that's important because I guess before his landmark uh, work, mm. right, Hypnosis was interesting, but it hadn't really proved truly its worth. But yep. what he was able to do was yep. prove, right. which is the ultimate <clears throat> hallucination, is pain. He mm. was able to prove that through hypnosis, yep. we could reduce pain and infection and bleeding just through the power of suggestion. And I've right. got my own experience with that. So that's kind of how I first uh, came across hypnosis. I was 18. I was sitting on my nan's couch because we used to hang out in my nan's right. Right? and I was reading the, the newspaper as we used to do back in the day. It was piles of newspapers and you'd spend Sunday, wouldn't you, going through all the newspapers. Like, it was like kind of a family tradition. Um, and I remember reading this article about this, it was um, hypnos hypnotist runs workshop in uh, Kentish town. And it was uh, this journalist that went on this three-day workshop with this hypnotist called Mervyn Meinel Jones. He's passed on now. And he was talking about um, how people would go to this workshop and he would explain how you can use self-hypnosis to cure smoking and, you know, weight loss and all the things that we know now was like th this was being talked about in this newspaper article. Mm -hmm. And he said, even, he even shows you how to eliminate pain, right? And I thought... That's right up my street. <laughs> I'm right, there. I'm right. so, yeah. That's right up my street. So I went, okay, I'm going on this course. So rings up, books in, goes to Kentish Town. And I'm living in Liverpool at the time. And you're right? like 18. I, 18, cool. right. Goes to Kentish Town. And I arrived at the house. I'll never forget it. I remember the place really well. And it was kind of all like... 35 and up middle class people, right? And I was this scally from Liverpool who was only 18, right? It's like, okay, I'm a little bit out of place here. Um, and then I spent the next three days in this workshop, which was just amazing. All the stuff we've talked about, but at the time it was like, wow. Yeah. Right? And, um, and he was explaining all the things that, you know, we know of hypnosis. And to finish, to finish the workshop, to kind of seal the deal, if you like, to solidify it in your mind that this shit really works. Mm. He says, what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna show you how to eliminate pain. I am bleeding through hypnosis. Okay, we're gonna put a pin through your arm, right? And I, and I was like, oh, okay, now this is gonna be the real test, isn't it, right? Mm. So puts you to, induces you into a, a trance state, does his script, whatever it was, I can't remember, but it was like you know, telling yourself that there's gonna be no pain, there's gonna be no bleeding, blah, 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 blah. And everyone's doing it. And some, when we, we, he brought us out of the state, mm. some people just refused. They went, no, I'm not sticking a pin in my arm. Right. right? Yep. They weren't ready yep. for it. Yep. Right? I was like, yeah, go for it, man. Yeah. So we, he, he gets the massive safety pin, right? I'm not about that long. <laughs> right? And then bends the end yep. right, to kind of uh, disturb, yeah, sterilize yeah. it, right? Yep. And then poof, goes into my arm like that. Yeah. Right, and then he fastens the safety pin, and there's a photograph of me like that with this pin in my arm. Right, and there was no pain. Right, there was no. I mean, I could do that now, but I go. Oh! Yeah. Well, how right. long we got? Maybe we'll get. Yeah. <laughs> and then he, I pulled it out. Right, this was the most interesting thing. The only thing that came out was plasma. Right, you know, like the liquid that carries the blood. Right, there was no blood. Right, and that yeah. for me blew my mind. That yeah, was fair like, enough. This yeah. has got Amazing. immense power. Right. Um, and that kind of the, the, the triggered that memory. I haven't thought about that in years. Was you know this guy, this this Raidsdale, yeah, Ersdale, Ersdale, you know, discovered that and then put hypnosis into a new, you know, a, a new level of respect, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if what you're talking about, which is this um, uh, hallucination, well, well, what's going on with pain? Well, you and think how does hypnosis yeah. get rid so of pain? Think about and that. Bleeding? Think about that amazing experience you had at eighteen. Yeah. In one thing, as you t as you're telling me, you know, I'm thinking, yeah, I, I've I've witnessed that, I've seen it. I haven't uh, chosen to hypnotize someone to that state yet. I've taken pain away from myself yeah. and others. Uh, I've you, always, you just broke your toe. I've always you? just broke my toe, so I was doing it last <laughs> night, and I've and I've always been a fan of punk rock, so a safety pin can't hurt, you know. <laughs> but I th but you know, in terms of what I was saying about internal hallucinations. Mm. Right, so if you've got, and we do have visual, auditory, and kinesthetic channels in our frontal cortex of our brain that deal with those specific wavelengths of information, digits, dig, like a digital computer. Mm. So 
the idea becomes, okay, I, the way I hallucinate what is going to happen when someone sticks a pin in my arm and the blood that's going to come out thereafter is something that I am causing to happen due to the, due to the particular set of hallucinations. That you believe should happen. Right. <laughs> Weird. Yeah. The minute, you, the, the minute you're offered in a, in, a, in a state when those suggestions are accepted, and as you said, not everyone was like, no, I'm not doing that anyway. That's, that's a great illustration of who has power over who. Yeah. The, hypnot the, hypnot the, the, the hypnotist doesn't have any power over the person they're working with. Mm. It's actually about giving that person power, the mm. back themselves. Yeah. If, if then those suggestions are treated in a way in a state where they can be differently arranged in terms of the hallucination. Now, that's an important bit. Mm. If those suggestions at that time for that individual are accepted and can be arranged differently to a different set of hallucinations that are, I will not feel that kinesthetic hallucination the way I felt it. And so pain being kinesthetic. Pain's a kinesthetic, it's a feeling, right? Yeah, yeah. It's something you feel. Yeah. I will not have any visual representation of blood. I won't see any blood. So in some sense, what you are focused in every sense, what you focus on internally mm -hmm. in, in, a for, in, a, in a collection or a set of internal hallucinations, you, the more you concentrate on them and back them up with language, that becomes your reality. But but that that in itself is like immensely profound. Yeah, well, right? and the implications of that are massive. just massive. Like, yeah. but you can control pain, you can control bleeding, right? Just through the power of your mind. So, what else can you do? I well, mean, where are the limitations? If if you know, we're talking about you know those fundamental primary things that most people are terrified of, and, and you know, who, who wants to bleed when they get caught? You know, if you. I mean, I'm very willing, and I don't know the answer to the question, but I'm I'm it's very more than but anything, yeah. I'm very excited to find out. Yeah, what is the limit? Now, I mean, realistic here, you know, if someone if if someone was to come in here with a samurai sword and chop my arm off, and I decided to go, I'm not going to bleed. Mm. I doubt very much yeah. that I would be able to do anything about the the, the blood going. Well, why? So, so this is an important question. Where, so where's the limit? Well, the limit for me would be because of the conditioning that I yeah. am surrounded by yeah. through my whole life, where I'm from, the way I was brought up, the, the time we live in, the culture, my neurological uh, restraints would not, I don't think, allow me to believe that I'm not going to bleed out and die. But if, if the trance was deep enough, if the hypnotist was exceptional from another planet right it, it was the best hypnotist ever theoretically mm. theoretically you should be able to stop that bleeding as well absolutely um, absolutely yeah. now james ersdale yeah. did prove that because uh, sorry to interrupt you on that james ersdale so, so uh, i remember reading is that so once he made those discoveries that medicine was then taking hypnosis seriously and was beginning to use it in many surgeries yeah but then they discovered cocaine yeah right and all of a sudden they no longer had to use hypnosis anymore and, and they could just knock people out and that was the end and of why was that why do you think c cocaine and chlorof chloroform chlor yeah. why why would you think that would seem attractive to a medical association well, money, <laughs> one and two for the for the subject. It's like you've really got to concentrate here. You're going to be wide awake, and we're going to chop your arm off, right? Or I'm going to give you this uh, injection, and it's, you're going to be unconscious, and you won't even know what happened, That's but right. you may die. Yeah, <laughs> you know. So, so I think, and here, and so it goes. Yeah, so this goes. day and age. Yeah, it, so it goes. Now, if you if you if you go deeper and deeper into, you know, we've both been experienced recently with someone that is pushing a certain kind of hypnosis under another under a different set of auditory suggestion mm. so hypnosis or nlp the difference between them tenuous at best realistically like for me mm. uh he, where he's going is that okay there is something inside of all of our tacit knowledge that knows how to stop things like that or cure things that are bi look could biologically destroy us mm there is something inside of us already that has dealt with things like that, so it could be... You're talking about John Grinder here? Yeah. Well, um, just to give the audience maybe a little bit of background, we've spent uh, 14 days on uh, Michael 
um, Carol's NLP Academy right. with John Grinder and the new code. He came over from America with Carmel. Carmen Bostick. Carmen Bostick Sinclair. My yep. apologies. Carmen Bostick Sinclair. And he presented his uh, new code. And emergent new code. And emergent new code. Um, before we get into that, because mm. I definitely want to talk about John's profound support and belief in the power of the unconscious mind. Right. Right, and his amazing way of describing, I don't know. <laughs> when asked questions about how the unconscious mind works, I think the best answer is, I don't know. Yeah. Just try it, do it, and if you get the result, who cares? Let me know how you get on. That, so that for me, was, that was the best bit, right? I really, really enjoyed that. But tell us, before we go any further here, mm, and it's mm -hmm. kind of, John Grinder is an important figure in this story. Right. Because he and uh, Bandler are, are credited as creating NLP, which is... Uh, I guess uh, growth from Milton Erickson. Yeah. So if we yeah if, if we, we come along, along that, that timeline yeah, yeah if we if we come along the timeline of Mesmer, Braders, Dow. Yeah. You then had the next like the players in the game if you like, historically speaking. You had a guy, a French guy, uh, Emil Cool. Mm. I think I don't know how to pronounce his name. Sorry, uh, his French name pronunciation. But he was a guy that um, discovered the. Um, affirmations you know in every day in every way i'm getting better and better yeah and he also discovered um or transcribed the idea of uh what's it called now um the law the three laws or the laws of suggestion oh a law of attraction the law of attraction the secret yeah the secret the, the basic the secret got it from his work and yeah. the placebo effect so this guy was no ah. slouch right yeah. but he but he realistically was not dealing with uh, he was more conscious mind yeah. so affirmations are a conscious rep, consciously repeating things like a mantra mm. you know of course it will affect change it depends how long you want to repeat it for and how many years and uh, the laws of attraction which that book the secret was derived from mm -hmm. three very simple laws the law of um, reverse effort the law of concentrated attention and the law of dom dominant effect which we, we won't go into now. If anyone's interested, I will. But these are all things that we experience in our life that snap into reality, what we do or we don't want. Very, 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 very briefly, the law of uh, concentrated attention, what you put your concentrated attention on tends to appear in your life. Mm. Right. What we resist persists. <laughs> right. Yeah. What you really spend a lot of time uh. really wanting to do happens, even if it's what you don't want. Mm. The law of reverse effort going... The more you go and do something thinking you're not going to be able to do it, the less likely you will be to succeed. Uh, I mean, that's evident in my life. I'm, I'm aware of it. And the dominant effect is the thing that you have a chain in your conscious mind where once that chain is linked together, when you have a suggestion in the chain, a suggestion, let's say suggestion is uh, a cheeseburger, and you link it together with uh, an emotional content, which is, oh, oh, that's going to feel amazing to have one. When you make that that link, that effect, what you get is the next thing you're buying two hamburgers. So those three things that, and there's other ones, but that he transcribed them. You then move out from him a little bit later still to Sigmund Freud, which, you know, uh, Richard Bandler of, of Sig had a great name for him, Sick Man Fraud. <laughs> uh, whatever you think about him, he'd done a lot of research and he was into hypnosis for a long time. Yeah. Uh, psychoanalysis realistically is a form of hypnosis mm -hmm. but in the end the legend has it that he didn't really have a very nice voice and he had really bad teeth and he said looking at people he, he realized looking at people people were more look, looking at his teeth going oh and it, and it wasn't really they weren't getting he wasn't so told confused. to close their eyes he wasn't he wasn't and it, well in the end he's like i'll sit behind you so you don't have to look at me <laughs> right, <okay. laughs> but apparently he was big into an, 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 uh, hypnosis for a while and he turned his back on it and then milton like so we're bang up to the date with milton yeah. erickson Milton Erickson was a PhD psychiatrist his whole life. But he's regarded as the, the father of, of modern hypnosis, isn't he? Modern hypnotherapy. Modern hypnotherapy. <coughs> hypnotherapy in the sense of using... Now, what he decided or what he ended up doing in his life, and he worked in a lot of uh, chronic wards, he decided... He, what does that mean? What does that work? If you tell someone they're going to a chronic ward, what does it mean? It means you're never getting out of it. You know, It means mm. basically, there you go, there's a suggestion. No one gives a shit. You're never going to get over it. Stay there and rub shit in your hair for the rest of your life. You know, I'm chronic. I'm this. I'm that. He started realizing. Do you think that's that, that's a, a state of mind? That's a belief. That's what the, the you know the, the the health issue that's challenging that person persists because of words like chronic being used. Well, not only, but if there is no hardware issues, in other words, yeah. if the if the if the if the processor isn't broken, 
you know, there's a thing in comp uh, computer science that they're all like software. We all know it. Mm. If you've got something that works in terms of hardware, with your phone or your watch or your laptop, and you put a bit of software in it that doesn't that doesn't work very well, you can't ruin the hardware no. with software. Mm. If you've got a machine that was out the back of a lorry and it was dropped on the floor and the screen's cracked, there's a, there's an issue with the hardware. You can't repair that with software. So, so how do you make the determination? Well, these are that's a very good question. Mm. If someone has severely severe neurolo from birth neurological constraints, mm. they are existing in a reality, a consciousness that is not what we would accept. Mm. So auti autism, yeah. they ex they autistic, deeply autistic people, they say they're locked inside and they can't X, Y, and Z. Mm. That, uh, uh, that's only a according to the way we live mm. in society, the way we communicate. We, people that, do, that don't see have, an, have, a, have some neurological defect, but they do say they see in another way. How do we know these things? But these are the things that you have to be realistic and go, okay, suggestion's not going to change that. You can see my son, you know. That kind of thing is ridiculous. But if you've got someone that is, I'm not sure if you use the current terminology, bipolar. Yeah. You're in manias. You're really happy and you're really sad. So it's, it's, a, it's a description of a mental state rather than a physical, or <laughs> a mental state that is causing physical changes. And, right. Yeah. And, if, and, if, and if these things are chemical imbalances of the brain, where is the chemical imbalance? Mm. Fight, like, and then just put the chemical that they need back where it needs to be. Mm. Nervous breakdown, he's had a nervous breakdown. What, what nerve broke? Can we put an MRI through and see what nerve's mm. broken and maybe route another one around it or something? Mm. So these are all, I'm not suggesting at all that oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, mental yeah. illness can be, is purely uh, because of the suggestion or the label but, you've been but, given but, but it. By its, by its very definition, mental illness right. implies that it's, in the mind. Right. Yeah, and therefore, if you use things like neuro-linguistic programming, which reprograms the mind, therefore, you know, it, it's it's plausible to suggest that that can help relieve chronic mental illnesses. If you, I mean, if you tell someone, I've seen a few people in my practice. Yeah. This is purely my experience now. I've seen quite a few people that have been sectioned. Now, that suggestion in itself is, mm. is di not diabolical, but it has an impact. On us as they well, were, the listener. They were sectioned. Yeah, it means they've totally lost their mind and they're in jail with, you know... Some Forcibly of the... removed from their environment yeah. and put in a place, yeah. in my even, mind... Actually, it's not even jail, it's worse than jail. It's, it's, right. yeah. They were sectioned. So mm. a couple, and, I, and a few people have been told that they would never, that I've dealt with, that they would never have a normal life. That's a crime against humanity, mm. in my opinion. Telling someone that has no authority, <laughs> or there's no met scientific medical way to prove to that person or that person's loved one that this part of their brain does not work, therefore they can never recover and have a normal as terms we understand it. If if that is not if that's not on the table, then what could we do to suggest what is bipolar, what is manic this, what is manic that, what is whatever we currently schizophrenia and we i hear voices in my head good we all do there's lots man. of people that don't they we, don't hear any voices we, they don't even have an internal dialogue <laughs> npcs that you know the uh, non-playing characters that's you know there's a phenomenon isn't it that there's a large portion of the population that doesn't have an internal monologue i've never i've never heard that but i think <laughs> yeah. that's bullshit yeah no that that they don't that they don't they don't have a visual representation in the head but you're the guy who works I mean, with the visual representation i, I just right? wonder how on earth is that proved mm. They ask them. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> they go, and, and they go, what, no. You mean there's people that talk to themselves? Now, I had a case. I had, I had a case of a guy that is, dis, is actually diagnosed as um, disassociative disorder. Disassociative disorder. And that is a belief that someone is so dissociated from themselves that they don't have any internal experience. Mm. Now, that's absurdly ridiculous, in my opinion. Mm. Of course, if you are so dissociated from yourself that you're living in another version of yourself but not in yourself, you've simply forgot to remember what it feels like, what it sounds like, or to what be it's who you are. Right. And sometimes if you're, if you're told that you can't do it, anyway, it's another subject. We were getting on to... But this um, is what Milton Erickson was dealing with. This is what Milton Erickson... And Milton Erickson, Milton Erickson became revered like a god. Mm. People, like this guy, like you can't, I can't overstress the brilliance of this man. 
and the differences that he made in people's lives by talking to them. He, di he didn't give anyone any drugs. The, there's a, an in, like a English side of what is it, um, a, a cute story. Someone gets an appointment with Milton Erickson and just the point of like, wow, I've got an appointment with him, they're nothing. already better. <laughs> <laughs> so his reputation preceded him to the level that right. the hypnosis was acting in front of him before they even got to see him. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and there is scientific evidence that how that happens, the way we perceive things, but again, we won't digress. Mm. That Milton Erickson, in the end, towards the last part of his life, he was a very accomplished hypnotist. So he would do, initially, he would do the stage hypnosis, the inductions, and he had arm levitation. Didn't he have a, the handshake? Isn't handshake that his famous induction one? is a very good one. Yeah, explain, explain that, because you did explain that to me once, and I thought, oh, that's how they do it, yeah. <coughs> it's, a, when something is unconscious, yeah. As you meet someone you never met before, we're ex we're accepted to understand that you go, "Hello, my name's Matt." Hello, go, my name. Yeah. That is an unconscious. Even though we're doing it and we're talking about it now, as I lean in and go out to put my hand towards yeah. you, you do it. Yeah. So it's an unconscious. We don't consciously think, "Oh, someone's doing that." I'm about to put my hand up. It's to like meet going them. into third or fourth gear in your car. Right. Yeah. Or or even going putting a fag in your mouth. Yeah. And going, I'm going for a lighter. Now that these things that they become, so I'm just going to back away from these things become. Deeply unconscious. There's no need to be aware consciously whatsoever of them. There's no need to use computational power in order to think that through. And that is exactly right. Yeah. And that's why they become unconscious. Mm -hmm. Because computational power equals energy. Mm. So your RAM is being saved, isn't it? Yeah. And your unconscious mind has learned there's certain things that they do. And it's not, of course, like walking, mm. having a drink, uh, saying good morning to someone. All these, these things that just responding to your name you know these things that we, we were like you know we're like robots someone sticks their hand out to you to shake if at that point and they've got no idea what you're about to do matches, sure, matches your hand but instead of we go out to do it yeah. i just lift your hand up to your face and yeah. say right so and uh, that's the handshake induction well because it's a massive pattern interrupt yeah someone is you, you Someone is going to, if you do that to someone and they don't know you and they've never heard of this, and you hold So them, all of a sudden you're staring at the flame. And you just, right. Yeah. You fix it and you say, just fix a point on your hand now as you look at your hand and you move it back and forwards. And I wonder if you can begin to wonder why it is I put your hand up like this and asked you to look at the lines on it and not your whole hand, just a specific <laughs> part of your hand. And as I'm moving that focus around backwards and forwards, and I could move it this way or that way, and any moment now, you're going to be surprised that I've taken my hand away from yours and your hand is just floating in air. <laughs> right? and that, mad. Yeah, and it, and it will be. It's called catalep catalepsy. Mm. That hand will be there. And then once you've got that catalepsy and that person staring at their hand, this point, their conscious and unconscious brain are going, what the, f what the fuck's going on here? Mm. So it's like a state of confusion. You've just is, gone yeah. boom, a little tap of that hand, and you're going to find in a moment I tap that hand, it effortlessly moves towards your face. And the more you try and resist, the more you find it. And I've done this with a lot of people, and they're going, trying to stop it moving. It, the suggestion has gone in like a torpedo because at that point, your critical faculty, your conscious mind, has been pushed out of the way. And all of a sudden, the suggestion that that hand is floating cataleptically and I'm just going to, my hand is going towards my, and when it does hit your head, you can sh shut your eyes and go into a wonderful deep trance, all the way down. Now, he developed that, Ericsson was the first person to develop that, and lots of other classical hypnotic inductions and uh, phenomena, and he realised as he got older and older and more and more experienced in his life that there was actually, there was no need to do any of that. <laughs> What's an, the, the reason of an induction ultimately, what is it, is to have eye closure, to relax someone and have eye closure. He, how about this? I'm sitting here talking to you and I'm going to go, Lawrence, I wonder if you can just close your eyes. <laughs> there you go, I've got eye closure. <laughs> mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you're in a trance. Mm. It means you've taken that suggestion. So the consent has, be, has, has begun to be formed, doesn't it? The consent chain that they're looking for. And I yeah. wonder with those eyes closed if you can be surprised of the sensation of your eyelids resting down and you can begin to turn off the rest of the muscles around your eyes if you want. And otherwise, <laughs> la di da di da So ultimately, what Ericsson was doing was telling stories. Now, in a very specific way, he understood the power of metaphor, 
he understood language, very intelligent man. He'd been around a lot of mental illness, whatever that might mean. And the more evidence he got of what, it, what, what is it that I'm doing that seems to be helping these people make changes in their life. He decided to not be bothered with that. He never wrote, as far as I know, well, he didn't. He never wrote a treatment of his techniques, what he was doing. But that brings us bang up to date in terms of modern hypnosis. You then have these two that we spoke about, Bandler, uh, John Grinder and Richard Bandler. Two guys, Bandler was, uh, at that point in his life, was a linguistics professor at the University of Santa Cruz. Bandler was doing, I think, computer science and philosophy and a few other things. Basic, long story short, Bandler wanted to understand what some of the people in the world that he had got introduced to one way or another, and I won't go deeply into it, but they were therapists. And he was like, to paraphrase, there's... There's these three people that I'm looking at. Initially, it was two. Uh, they, have, they seem to have extrasensory perception in terms of how they help people. Virginia Satir and Fritz Perls. Fritz Perls invented a form of psychotherapy called gestalt therapy, which is very, very powerful, helped a lot of people. And at that time, they say there was like hundreds of psychotherapy, different forms of psychotherapy in the States. And these two, it seemed, were revered as a god and a goddess. And anyone that done those those forms of therapy, specifically the, those two, he was inquisitive. Bandler, why? Cause effect. He wanted to know the why, not how. At that point, what are they doing? Why are they so good? He, as a as a scientist, was like, okay, maybe they are magic. Maybe they do have extrasensory perception. Let's look into that before we take it off the table. Okay, they're not giving anyone drugs. They're not magic. They're not witches and wizards. What, what could it be? It must be, it must be what language. Mm. It's talking therapy, ultimately. It yeah. must have something to do with... But, but what the, how, who do we know? Who do I know that could, I could ask to have a look at the transcripts of their sessions? I don't know who it was that suggested, what about John Grinder, the, the, the professor of linguistics? So he goes to see him and you know, the, you know the story. Eventually, he Grinder reads the transcripts. Now this guy was pu a published, well respected in his field before he was a professor of linguistics at the University of Santa Cruz. But I think he was published, in, he was a syntactician. So he done, his papers were on syntax. Incredible. Uh, who would have thought... Perfect that, man for the job. Who would have thought? But this man was also an anti, a passionate anti-war protester. Mm -hmm. And the first thing he... When Bandler famously said to him, I'm looking at therapist, he slammed the door in his face. Before he'd done that, he said, therapy disrupts revolution. <laughs> Leave me alone. I'm not interested in waste of time. A lot of bourgeois rubbish. la di da di da di da Bandler ended up going, look, just read some. And he was like, all right, kid, whatever. And he read some transcripts and apparently he was like well, that's really not typical language that Fritz Perls is using or Virginia Satir. That's very, very weird. Like, do they know each other? And they didn't. So they come to the same conclusions independently without working in conjunction? Amazing. Wow. Yeah. But neither of them knew what they were doing specifically. Mm. They just was like, well, it seems as though this works. And she was like, this seems as though this works. And they were both... Famously, like, had one was one of them was like, no, it's a load of rubbish. I'm not going to do it. It's very manipulative. And the other one was like, whatever. Let's put your projections of what you don't like in a chair and smash the chair up. You know, mm -hmm. like whatever, <laughs> whatever gets you through the night. So these, the more and more Bandler uh, got Grinder involved, and the more Grinder read the transcripts, the more he wanted to read. And he was like, listen, I, I'll I'll unpack this. And I'll spend time on this and I'll, and I'll explain to you linguistically what is happening and why it's different. But I need to learn what they're doing. I want to actually get involved in this and do it. And Bandler, Richard Bandler at that point, could do a really good impersonation of Fritz Perls mm. and do the therapy like he did. He just, he became Fritz Perls. Mirrored him. He mirrored him. Yeah. He, used to, uh, he, went, he went to a lot of the gestalt therapy sessions and used to impersonate him and became him, mirrored him, modelled him. So he's gone all right, I'll teach you how to do it without knowing. So the core activity of NLP was, a, was initially 
modeling what does that mean to unconsciously assimilate someone's ability and that was part of an assignment yeah, so, yeah. So that's how they discovered modeling was like, you know, go and find out what Ericsson's doing and report back, and they that's modeled right. Ericsson. Someone told them, some other guy, I think it's Bateson, I'm not sure, uh, if you're getting involved in hypnosis and unconscious, because Bandler went out and bought all the books he could about hypnosis, I want to model it, I want to be a hypnotist. And someone said, you need to go and see this guy in Phoenix, mm. Milton Erickson, if you want to learn hypnosis. They did. They then spoke to him and said, listen, we, we want to model... No one knew what that was in that, in that context at that point, modelling. We want to try and understand what it is you do linguistically that's causing the changes that you achieve mm. or help people achieve with their life, with your language. Ericsson was like, whatever, it's up, up, maybe, or maybe I'll be interested in learn something. So what they then developed this thing. At that point, it wasn't called neuro-linguistic programming. It was an adventure that they were going on to, to, together to try and understand the power of what the power of linguistics, the power of language in terms of change. Now, they went on to say we could have, potentially, we could have modelled anything. It could have been mechanics. These three really good mechanics, what is it that they do? But by modelling what those, using the same, uh, and accepting the same presuppositions, they would have ultimately got the, the, the technology would have been, this is how you become an excellent mechanic. But they just so happened starting, because of, maybe it was coincidence, on therapists. They then, the more they were putting together, they they throw. I think the first book, the first book was called, I believe, the structure of magic. Mm, it's frogs and princes as well, wasn't it? Fro the frogs and princes. That was and the big one, wasn't it? The frogs and princes, <coughs> or, or the one that broke through. Well, I think, yeah, I think realistically, structure of magic one was most of Richard Bandler's the uh, thesis. Not all of it, but because John Grinder contributed, and then they made the book. But, but the first third maybe was Bandler's thesis. Um, the, that book's a hard read. Mm. You know, you've read it, I've read it God knows how many times and I'll continue to read it God knows how many times. Mm. They then made part two of that. They then done the hypnotic patterns of Milton Erickson with the same kind of linguistic treatment. At this point, the meta model, which is, a, which is something that helps you understand utterances in terms of therapy, not only therapy, to decode what people are not saying with what they are saying, if that makes sense. And a few other... Uh, tricks and tips and tools that they had picked up, which they then called neuro-linguistic programming. They applied those sensibilities to understanding specifically what they thought Milton Erickson was doing with his patterns of language. And they'd done two books on it, The Hypnotic Patterns of Milton Erickson 1 and 2. So they were trying to make explicit, mm. or that trying, they were making explicit, explicit just in written form this is what he's doing this is why they it were works. codifying his technique or his stories into something that other people could use right. repeat and get the same result that's right yeah. they, that's right so yeah. and they were they were coding it making it explicit as the in the coding and saying there you go there's the books you can learn to do this and let us know how you get on mm -hmm. uh this is where I, I became very interested because initially I studied hypnosis and then through the hypnosis I, I discovered Bandler, Grinder and NLP. And what I found really, really interesting, and I still do, I, the metaphor I use is, as we've discussed already, hypnosis, you can ask someone to look at a flame or a pocket watch or just close their eyes, give them suggestions and help them get to a state of, na of a natural brainwave where they're relaxed and <coughs> focused internally, whatever that's called, which is a wonderful. NLP coded it and made it explicit. So for me, NLP is the vocabulary of, of hypnosis, mm -hmm. like mathematics is the vocabulary of physics. NLP is a way that I can understand subjectively as far as I need to, what is going on with a hypnotic subject of mine? Or is, it, is it fair to say that um, hypnosis is eyes closed, NLP is eyes open? Um, it, ooh, I, you know, I, I think, I think uh, in some sense, in terms of going to see a coach, yeah. NLP, hip, hypnosis, will, you might say I'm going to see a hypnotherapist or a hypnotist. NLP, they'll say I'll go and see an NLP coach. Right? Or, or, or is NLP... Is NLP uh, Ericksonian hypnosis recoded? N not, no, 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 okay. no. There are schools of you can go and learn Ericksonian hypnosis, but whilst he was alive, there, 
it he never not. uttered those words. Like Bruce Lee, you know, yeah. you can go and learn Jeet Kune Do, but the whole idea of that was like, there's no styles, just find your own. Mm. Uh, so it, Ericksonian hypnosis is a thing, but it isn't NLP. Okay. NLP is a thing, but it isn't hypnosis. Where they all meld, and bisect and bifurcate, whatever the words are, that's what I find interesting. And I decide to, again, to absorb what is useful for me and I've really find it interesting to study the linguistic side of a change process that I might be able to enable someone to have. Mm. It's not important, it's not necessary to effectuate or help that change happen. But for me, NLP is a way that I can go, okay, I understand this process as, as much as I think I need to, to really being, so it's congruent with me, mm and I'm congruent with it, so I can just go with full congruency with everyone I meet, and that that person that sits in front of me doesn't really have a chance. If, the, if, they, know, if, the, if they know, the ch and quite often they don't know, but when they are aware of the change they want, it is gonna happen. Mm. Because it, it was quite a discovery mm. uh, that Bandler and Grindler had with their work with Ericsson. Uh, you know, created this whole massive movement which is still chugging along today yeah and there are a lot of people around the genesis of that discovery right and um as i said before about you know when i went on that course mm. it's not long after that i was like okay what, what's going on with hypnosis and you searching on dial up you know before broadband that go on the internet and go what's going on no way, yeah. and it was like uh, there was a site called uh, life tools it was based on blackburn i think and they they were doing things like photo reading and they had like a brain machine where you could change the brain waves uh, using lights but they had a book called Awaken the Giant Within by Tony Robbins. Right. I bought the book, but it was just too thick for me at the time, right? And I remember reading it, and it was like, and I also bought Frogs and Princes. It's a good one, yeah. That's a I, seminar. I tried to read Frogs and Princes, but again, it was I wasn't ready for that information at that time. Right. But what I remember is that Tony Robbins suddenly appeared into the scene, and he called his NAC, right. I think, which right. was an NLP. Yeah. But, but, what happened there if, if i don't know if you know but yeah was, there was this energy wasn't there there was these people who were you know at the genesis of this new discovery of nlp yeah. but they all went off in different di different orbits and, yeah, and it yeah. wasn't it wasn't without conflict either and it wasn't nope. without uh you know drama human nature and i always when i first found out about the fact when bandler and grinder split i was like hold on how does that He's got these two people. Oh, well, you, no, but the Beatles have broke up. But somehow it was like, how could, is this, is this really incongruent to the material that they're publishing? Mm -hmm. Like the, the, the communication excellence and how to deal with your state and mm. how could you ever get to a point, therefore? That you couldn't overcome you couldn't, your differences. Right, so this is, and this yeah. is a big difference. It's important to go, what, it's a great point that you make. Mm. And, and what happened, you know, no matter how righteous you are or what you want to achieve and how, how you might want to help people, the world we live in, the paradigm we live in, you've got to earn money. It's the materialist universe. It, yeah. We have to somehow, we don't have to, but you know, it's very, very it becomes increasingly more difficult, I believe, these days to live mm -hmm. off grid without any, you know. So anyway, that's another podcast. Mm -hmm. But uh, Tony Robbins was taught NLP explicitly by John Grinder. Wow. the co-creator of the whole movement. Yeah. And, and apparently, well, you've seen a lot of people, he's very famous, he's charismatic and he's very good at communicating the concepts. He's awesome. I mean, he's really, really good at it. Yeah. He's very he, good when at you, it. When you find out he's a linguist, you go, oh, yeah, I can understand that. You know? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. He, he, what he done and what happened, he, he started training people because ultimately band, Richard Banner and John Grinder were... were but when they realised they were onto something big, didn't they? Because they yeah. jacked in what they were doing in the university right. and off they went to do training. Well, they, they started training. training people to train NLP. Yeah. And that's like the metaphor there I use is like you're in a band with your mates in a garage when you're 10 or 15 and your hardcore sensibilities are never sell out and then you go and do a demo and a record label goes, oh, we're interested. And then they go, uh, how interested are you? Well... A and M want to sign you, and you go, nah, no way, that's selling out. Mm. Now the reason why you get in a band is one thing. The reason why you go and record the music, a demo, that's another thing. It's different to the reason you first wanted to express and have fun with your mates. The reason a record label wants to put your music out 
is they think they can earn money, but you can then be a professional musician and earn your living doing it. Is that selling out? What's the re- what, what's the reason for doing it? If well, I think I think selling out is, is kind of understood as you're selling out your principles, right? Right for money. Right. So, that's I think that's more. So of at the that definition. point, yeah. and this is getting it back to the NLP. At that point, if you don't have any principles to begin with, then you're not selling out. <laughs> or you just go, well, we don't want to record our music, and yeah. because to record it, we're going to sell it, and we don't want to. Mm. We don't want to sell it. We're not selling our print. We're doing it for fun. Yeah. Now, Bandler and Grinder got to a point, they had to earn money. They yeah. had to sell. They went and do these. So they'd done those four books that they collaborated on together. And then the other three or four are transcripts of seminars that they'd done together. Mm. And when you read like Frogs and the Princes, it doesn't say when B- Grinder's talking or Bandler's talking. It's mm. just a transcript. They're great books. Uh, they then started doing more and more courses all around the world, and they still do. Mm-hmm. And at some point... You're publishing books to earn money. You're also publishing fair books. Fair enough. Fair enough. To, yeah. to spread this technology, this concept around to help other people. You're then doing courses to train other people. Mm. The NLP. That's your living, isn't that, it? You that's know? your living. Yeah. And those people that are going to train those other people all pay back. It's almost like the mafia. Yeah. You have to kick it upstairs to the, wow. to the boss. Yeah, yeah. So, so imagine you've got someone as charismatic and as forward thinking and dynamic as, as Tony Robbins. He's training, a lot of, he's training a lot of NLP trainers. And Bandler and Grinder, I don't know, but I would imagine, because why wouldn't you? That's business. We're mm. going to go, well, every certificate you sell, we want that you give, you're going to have some, some of it. Yeah. And, and, and I'd imagine... It's tribute, isn't it? It's yeah. tribute passed off. <laughs> you've got to pay, pay the boss, you know? <laughs> Uh, and, and fair enough, but at some point, which again is human nature, I'm sure, I don't know, but Aunt Tony Robbins must have gone, I, I, I don't want to keep paying all these dudes all this money. Well, if you think about how certification works, it's an act of hypnosis in and of itself. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. I mean, look at the classic example of it used in narrative storytelling is The Wizard of Oz. Right. right. At the end of The Wizard of Oz, the lion is given a certificate that he's got a heart. And he believes scare, it. And he believes it. And the <laughs> sc- scarecrow is given, you know, one for a brain. The tin man is, or the tin man is the heart, isn't it? Yeah. Right. But they're given this certificate and they hold it up. Yeah. Right. Right. right, right. So, and whenever we go into great metaphor, isn't it? whenever we have, whenever we go into uh, a, a hypnotic, uh, a hypnotist's room. Right, they have the certificates on the wall in mm-hmm. order to put you in a relaxed state. That this guy knows what he's, he's doing. He's got a certificate. That he knows what he's doing. Yeah. Right. But wh- who gives the certificates? Right. 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 Yeah. But in this case, it's the guys who discovered NLP. So what they're saying is, this has got credibility. You, this guy's been trained correctly. Therefore, you're in safe hands. Uh, and I totally agree with that. Yeah. And uh, there needs to be some kind of way to qualify who you're seeing. Yeah. Because you know, someone uh, <coughs> can go. I've done a three-day NLP course. I'm an NLP practitioner. The, the Catholic Church do with the apostolic tradition. Right. Every priest is ordained with the hands of another priest, and that goes back right to, to Jesus. That's what they say is this line of, orda- of ordaining priests. Right. That's the apostolic tradition. So in, in the Catholic Church, the Christ is like Bandler or Grindler, and they're given the certificates to right. say that this priest has been doing this for 2,000 years. And, and that in its self because of that tradition the person at the end receivers are okay if you're going to be if you're going to go and have this if you're going to go and do your confession to someone i want it to be with someone that has a lineage back to the original rapport right it's established through the apostolic tradition because right. you trust you i guess rapport it can be reduced to trust right is that because yeah, yeah, yeah. this priest has a one long lineage yeah one certification go yeah. all the way back 2000 years to christ right you know and i guess uh, the, the whole certification process yeah. of going into a whatever uh, professional it is is like who's the, who's give the certificate you know? well i do i agree with that and mm. i do also um, agree with something that michael carroll would often say to me mm. uh the owner of the nlp academy yeah he would all, he would he said to me a couple of times you know those those fucking certificates ain't you know they don't mean anything mm. now i i ask him a little bit okay hold on why do you give them then you know so if they don't mean anything and, I, and what he what he said and what i from what i understood what he meant which is what you're talking about you can have a certificate it doesn't mean you know what you're talking about mm. you can have you can have your hands put on you by that priest but it does not mean you are a holy man mm-hmm. so 
I agree with you. In some sense, rapport is is a trust. Mm. But I've also, and I'm sure you have, been in situations with people where you are expected to trust them, but you don't. Yeah. The rapport is not, it's not quite, there. it's not there. And even yeah. if they've got 50 certificates from the Holy Holy Ghost himself. Yeah. So I, I understand in terms of, well, financially, what from what I understand happened, Tony Robbins was like, okay, enough's enough. I'll do my own stuff. I've paid them enough. Yeah. I'm going to call it ABC or NAC, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And then he wrote a book, a massive breakthrough book, wasn't it? The um, Wait, A Week in a Giant with him. There's another one that he'd done, oh, I think, yeah. was his first bestseller. Well, that was the, I think, oh, maybe I'm wrong, but that was the one I remember anyway. That was the big breakthrough as far as I'm concerned, but he probably did more after that. He's done a he's lot. He's done lots, he? hasn't he? Yeah. So what he's done, he's gone, because I've, I've read, the one I've wrote, well, I think the one I read was Unlimited Power. Yeah, there's that one as well. And it's yeah. an interesting story. That was on my bookshelf. For, it, was a, it was my wife's, my, my wife's dad gave it to her. My wife and I have been together like 20 years and I, I used to just see it and didn't give, didn't pay any, atten any attention. No, like, and one day I just, we were on our way, we were going camping, I think. And I was sitting on our, we're living in our new house where you've been. I was sitting on the stairs and I just noticed that book. And I'd already started studying hypnosis. I talk about synchronicities, I don't know. Mm. And I just noticed, I was sitting on the stairs waiting for Karen to do something and I just went, I might just take it to, like, yeah. I'm going camping. It was old, it was an original, so all the pages are brown and yeah. all weird. Like, And just, be, I was like, I'll take that and I'll read that when I'm away or, or not and just flick through, to open the book and the first page I read, I was like, oh, that's cool. Now, I'd never read any NLP books at this point mm. and I went camping and just banged through that book man like my wife was like are we are you That's camping, you know, are yeah. you camping yeah, or yeah. not i was like this is amazing yeah. radical stuff yeah. but written in a way that's not difficult to understand. Yeah. Super, super accessible, really easy to understand. That was his, that was his power, wasn't it? His that ability is, to communicate to the masses. That remains his power in terms of commercial commercial yeah. success. Because mm -hmm. if you then and I did my nature is okay. Where did that come from? I learned about Grinder and da 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 da, da and I and I bought a copy of uh, the Structure of Magic. Mm -hmm. And again, I I was away, and I read the first few pages and went, "What the fuck is going on in this book?" Mm, very dense, isn't like, it? Like what yeah. on earth? <laughs> what yeah. the? And closed it, and then just kept being drawn back it's to like it. It's like for black belts, isn't it? Really? You yeah, know, it's, like, it's brutally linguistic, yeah. and the, the terminology is. I mean, it's interesting because obviously now I'm around the, that a lot. Mm -hmm. So it, I read it and just go, oh, it's all good, you yeah. know. But then I read the second one. I'd never read any more Anthony, Tony Robbins books. But what he then, what he'd done then was go, I can be, this can be for every man and every woman. Mm -hmm. You don't need to be a linguist. You don't need to be an intellectual. You don't need to have a change in your life. Here we are. This is how you do it. And clearly... It's helped, it's worked, but it was NLP mm. and it is NLP. Oh, yeah, yeah. That yeah. is a derivative of hypnosis, which is a derivative of which that is went a derivative to court, of, didn't it? That went to court that whole idea of is NLP trademarked? Yeah, and it was found that it isn't, right? Right, so anybody can you know um, create their form of it, yeah, uh, and that's kind of what happened with some of the Bama, techniques you Grindr. cannot. Uh, Grinder is now Own it, got he's got new code NLP, which I think you could, which they did. Okay, the new code is so so he Bandler goes has also done design human engineering and a few other offshoots of classic code NLP, and Grinder came along with a supposition of okay, the original stuff that we coded back in the day. Since then, I've looked at and gone, it's amazing. It's all elegant, elegant mm. patterns. They work. Yeah. But I think there are some coding errors. Mm. I think there's stuff that I, we overlooked. But that kind of brings us up to the modern day and or up to present day with you and I and yeah. maybe the end of this particular round of uh, this hypnotic story because I reckon we could probably go for another four hours on this, <laughs> to be honest. But, um, so, yeah, so you, you kindly introduced me to Michael Carroll of the NLP Academy. Right. Um, 
he, he run his, uh, his, uh, his course in Villa Gale in Lagos mm. a few weeks ago and I went and did the video for it and the live stream and it was a fantastic experience and it was cyclic um, it was for me also it was um, it was uh, like the, the the closing of a circle almost it was nostalgic because right. as I just said I bought Frogs and Princes and Anthony Robbins 20 odd years ago and never really pursued it right. other than that I've, I've, there's parts of my life times in my life where I'll dip in to hypnosis and then I'll pee yeah. and I'll dip out and I'll right, dip well, in yeah. and I'll dip out right but n n now recently this is probably the most consistent period where I've really been into it but anyway it was such how was it for you seeing John Grinder there in the that's room? what I was going to say right it was amazing that wow I bought this guy's book 20 years ago and here he is and I get the <laughs> opportunity to meet him chat to him film yeah. and uh, that was such a it was like a weird experience in, in a sense yeah. but it was great and what what, what John brought was his um, reimagining of NLP, New Code NLP, which is not so new actually, it's been around for a while, yeah, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, but yeah. his emergence, New Code, that's the new stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And um, he was um, presenting these ideas to the audience, and I thought it was great the way he presented it, it was really persuasive. Right, because he was so cool and how he did it. Very you know? hypnotic also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was it was just he had a really good style. Yeah. And uh, that was the one thing that came through that whole two weeks was his um, fascination, his deep fascination with the unconscious mind yeah. and not understanding how it worked and that not even being important, right, as long as you get the results. And John was, or is in his 80s mm. and is an amazing example of somebody who could be in their 80s and be fit and strong and all of his faculties are super sharp. He's still there. He's still absolutely, totally present. Intimidating. But, but, but inspiring. Mm -hmm. if, mm -hmm. You know, if inspiring. If this is the way that having control over the human operating system can, you know, have you experiencing life in your 80s, then that's something I want to have, have a taste of. Yep. And he was talking about, you know... Um, you know, I'm going to be here till I'm 120 at least. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, but but it, the way he said it, it wasn't like it was a, you know, a, an empty joke. It was like it was congruent. He, he was congruent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he absolutely believed it, and I, I wouldn't bet against him. No, right? no. But that was a fantastic thing for me to to be able to be around that. Yeah, cool. And it was this idea. Maybe we can finish up on this mm. topic, which is um, the unconscious. Mm. When people say what's hypnosis, basically what we're asking is what's the unconscious, and that's right. probably why it can't be answered because that's the realm to which change agents or hypnotists enter in order to bring about this change. Mm -hmm. Now, there was one thing I kind of perceive from that is that you know, since we've had the materialist revolution there's certain language that is no longer accepted. There's certain linguistics that are no longer accepted. Or the linguistics, if you use them, get you certain labels. Yep. And there was people giving examples of how the unconscious works. Mm. And I think it might have been calm, and she said, you know, I did this with one person, and they just said, it's the Holy Ghost. Right. Right? And um, I thought... And, and it was a bit scoffed at actually in the room. It was like, oh, oh you know, the Holy mm. Ghost, right? Mm. And, and I thought, well, well, actually, all that's changed is the is the linguistics. That's right. right? All that's changed is is that a, a previous generation, or previous generations before the materialist revolution, would would um, articulate these ideas of the unconscious as we now know them as the Holy Ghost. Yep. But now we look back and go, oh, that's just silly superstition, mm -hmm. right? But all it is for me is a shift in language because even the materialists can't tell you what the unconscious is. They're no. still scratching around trying to give you all these definitions right. because they're afraid, I don't know whether they're afraid is the right word, or um, um, not prepared to take that step into the unconscious, right? right? Yeah, and yeah. maybe accept or maybe even entertain that we are, um, you know, entering a, a realm of what would be understood as magic. Yeah. Right. Because that's, again, just another term that was used pre the materialist revolution. Because yeah. if you look at, um, you know, Mesmer is regarded as the father of hypnosis, but I think it goes back a lot, lot further than that. Probably goes back to the dawn of man, like you said with Anton Wilson. There's a very famous occultist 
from England called John Dee, mm -hmm. as you're well aware. Mm -hmm. John Dee signed his name at 007, and he was very into this whole, whole idea of hypnosis, but wasn't called that back then. He put himself into a state of trance with his partner, John Kelly. Mm -hmm. right? And John Kelly basically, uh, um, um, John Dee, under trance, recited an entire book called Enochian Magic yeah. that John Kelly transcribed. Mm -hmm. And this was done in a state of hypnosis, mm. right? So, so I don't think it, it starts with mesmer. It goes at least back to John Dee. I agree. Right? But what was he channeling in order to be able to write a book on Enochian Magic? Right? And point. then you move forward quite a, a, a vast amount of time is... Um, during COVID, mm -hmm. and I had not much else to do. Mm -hmm. That was a period when I got back into hypnosis a little bit. And there's a website called hypnosisdownloads.com. Excellent website. You mm -hmm. can download uh, audios for specific things that you might want to work on mm -hmm. with yourself. Yeah. For personal cool, development. I've, I've heard of it. It's really good. But one particular that I downloaded, I downloaded a few because I didn't have much else to do. <laughs> I downloaded the one called Automatic Writing. Right. Automatic writing was putting yourself into a trance state and then allowing your pen to, you know, create things, whether it be words or images, and uh, some amazing stuff came out. Right. And then I discovered that the surrealist movement, mm -hmm. the surrealist movement, which you know, obviously Salvador Dali is the most famous artist of, mm -hmm. was um, was was codified through a manifesto in which they said, if you want to be a surrealist, you have to do it under trance. And it's a, basically a form of automatic writing in which they are uh, entering into the other to bring art from the other side. Mm -hmm. um, of uh, the brain. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> so this is, this is the question, is, is, is that if we don't even know where the mind is, how do we know it's in the brain? Well, I think if you... So, so what, the, the point I'm trying to get to is where, where John Grinder was talking about the unconscious mm. and uh, about not knowing what it is, where it is, you know, what's going on there, and you don't need to know. Well, isn't there something else that we're missing here from the conversation in terms of, like, where did John D acquire that information? Where did Edgar Casey? the sleeping hypnotist or the sleeping psychic he was called, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Edgar Casey, one of the most famous psychics in modern history. He'd, his wife had basically put him into a hypnotic trance and he'd be asleep like that. And he'd you know, talk to people's relatives. He would tell you what was happening in the future, all these things. Mm -hmm. what, what is going on there? What's your thoughts <clears throat> on that? Because I don't know whether you're you know, solely in the materialist universe or you will entertain these ideas that we are actually tapping into um, more of the infinite than the finite universe? I, yeah, I mean, great questions. And as you say, they're realistically probably, uh, we could probably do another several <laughs> getting into it. But I, I mean, if I'm, if I'm quite honest, I also, you know, I, I think I told you I'd done a lot of reading about Alistair Crowley mm -hmm. myself, mm -hmm. was interested in, in that and John Dee and a lot of the things I've just started to be exposed. Carlos Castaneda is very interesting. Uh, the idea of, is there something bigger than the subjective interpretation of who you are and who I am? Is there something bigger? Without, without a doubt, of course there is. Mm -hmm. Do I have any specific definitions of what it is or how he may have gone into a chance and received that book? And apparently that's what Crowley done as well. <clears throat> um, and that's what a lot of writers and musicians have done. Well, just on that point, sorry to interrupt you, is because you brought up Crowley, so I feel as if I've got to interject. Well, there's a, and, and we're in Portugal. There's a famous story of Alastair Crowley comes to Portugal, to Lisbon, and Fernando Pessoa mm -hmm. becomes his interpreter, and they stay together for a week, right? <laughs> and Fernando Pessoa showed um, Alastair Crowley around Lisbon and was his interpreter. And it's suggested that... Crowley taught Fernando Pessoa hypnosis, right? And that's where Fernando Pessoa went from just an average poet to the guy who created all of these characters because Crowley had taught him hypnosis. So well, I thought he, he did to Jack with that little he's story. A, he, he's an interesting character. And mm. I think for sure there's all kinds of synchronicities, as Robert Anton Wilson would call them, yeah. that become uh, unavoidably uncomfortable. Mm. There's like why on earth would someone be able to receive a Nokian magic? Why would some UFO abduction cases report those same words from that language? Mm. Not all of them, but that have had no contact ever. You could say, okay, they're lying. They have. They're all students of a Nokian magic. But a couple of Marines that had unexplained time loss 
and had a, a fragmentation of words that were being communicated telepathically with them were from the Enochian language. Now, these, these things that go, okay, there is something bigger than me and you. Is there something missing, something that's deeply hidden? I, yeah, I think so. Uh, is that something we can explore through hypnosis? That's really what I'm looking for, absolutely. right? Absolutely. Well, let's go and find out what it is. Well, if you think about it simply in these, ter in these terms, for me... If, if you have, we do know we have left and right hemispheres of the brain, mm -hmm. MRI technology and science at this point, whatever, so what, you know, but they've gone, okay, the, this side of the brain, lots of people always like to say to me, oh, that side does that side and this side of the body creates, okay, that aside, the left side of the brain is commonly understood as the conscious side, the conscious mind. The right side then is the unconscious. If we have certain functions of conscious mind, let's call the conscious mind the critical, the critical, the critical, Critical, <laughs> critical faculty. That's not easy to say. If that's the critical faculty, the conscious mind, if you turn your critical faculty off, what's left? And, and when you turn your critical faculty off, that's also digital communication of words, right? Because that's computed in the left side of the brain. If you take words and your, and your critical analytical ability away from yourself, if you could just turn it off, and with, with this thing called hypnosis, it appears you can, mm -hmm. what is left? The answer then is, as far as I can tell, anything yeah. and everything is left. So were these people, uh, Jesus Christ... Moses included, any of the main uh, religious deities, mm -hmm. could you construe that they were at some point, in one way or another, taught to go into profound altered states? And tap into the other. Right. Yeah, and channel the other, you know, the, the power of, of, of creation. And, and be enlightened. Yeah. So it, is there a way, do we... I mean, it's a, it's a profoundly interesting and perhaps, perhaps disturbing question mm -hmm. if, you t if you do try and pursue it and get to the bottom of it mm -hmm. and, and then think, well, what, where could that extra intelligence, what could it be and where could it be coming from? This is part two of this debate in terms of... Uh, sorry, it's not a debate, it's a wonderful conversation, mm -hmm. but the debate is... Everything has always been construed as coming from above. Yeah. Is, an, is that intelligence, did it quite literally come from above and are we still connected to it to, in some part of our DNA that we've chosen to forget for whatever reason? And is that intelligence always available to us and is it still there and is it around and is it above in space somewhere mm -hmm. in another universe or another dimension or whatever? Who knows? Magnificent questions to consider and ponder. Mm -hmm. Um one thing's for sure, this thing that is difficult to define, hypnosis, for me and my experience and my work, is it's very real. It, it, it helps people make massive breakthroughs in their life, which is phenomenal. Uh, it creates artistic creativity to, to, to somehow flourish where maybe it hadn't before. What, what, where does that end? the potential of it, I'll be more than happy in 20 years time <laughs> to sit here or somewhere like this with you again and say, right, well, I've got another 20 years of experience. And I tell you what, it's far, far more mysterious than I could have ever imagined. Well, somehow I, uh, I, I think it'll be a lot less than 20 years, right? Before we <laughs> sit back down here again. And uh, we've been going for nearly two hours now, right? Wow, there's so, hypnosis. Yeah, yeah and it just flew by. So uh, we didn't even get a chance mm. to cover all of the other wonderful things that you've done in your life. You know, musician, you know, a f amazing furniture maker, an amazing surfer. But that then definitely leads us into the next podcast. Maybe we can just, t we can wind up, I think, for the last 10 minutes mm. is... Um, as I wanted to talk to you about, you know, how you arrived in Algarve, but I was so impatient and excited to talk about hypnosis that I wanted to just get that, you know, uh, covered first, but I knew we would go on and on and on and on. I, and we could probably definitely go on for another another day. Um, so now that I'm speaking to people in Algarve, and obviously this is how we've met, mm. 
how did you end up here? I mean, what, what, what brought you here? Because you've been here for 25 years, haven't right, you? It's you amazing, know? yeah. yeah long, so. long to, well, it, I came here as on a holiday, on a couple of holidays, because I wanted to learn to surf. Mm. <clears throat> Some kind of part of me that was, you know, I was brought up in Essex, so I could just about swim when I came here, let alone <laughs> surf, and that's true. Uh, I grew up skateboarding, big skate park where I used to live in Essex. That was my, that was my reason for being, you know. And of course, I'd always see pictures of surfing and go, this is where skating comes from, you know, so that would be cool. It looks amazing. But I mean, I was really not athletic as a child at all. Mm. Uh, really couldn't swim front crawl more than 15 meters <laughs> 25 years ago. <laughs> so um, I came on a couple of holidays. I was in a band at the time. The band had got to the point where it looked like it was done as much as it could do, um, which was fine and I was looking to do something else but I didn't quite know what and um, it's very difficult to think about that story now without using yeah. what I think I understand about hypnosis and yeah, the, to do filters that and, you've and other, to and other, the world you know unconscious yeah. anyway I um, one thing led to another and I came here I, I got I'd done three holidays backs and forwards and then this time this trip is turned into 25 years because I never went back but I had I didn't plan to live here i learned to surf and initially I was like I'm going to go there learn to surf learn to swim <laughs> first uh, and then I can travel around and as a surfer and see other places and whatever maybe I'll get in a band and again one day and that that turned into 25 years and I run surf camps here and I had one in Sri Lanka and surfing was always something that I'd done it wasn't me I, you know, when I say it wasn't me it's a very important part of my life but I'm not a surfer. Yeah. You know, I'm also not a musician. I'm also not a hypnotist. I'm also not a furniture maker. I'm also not a... F I, I studied physics for a while at the Open University. I'm certainly not a physicist because I'm not <laughs> a genius. But I'm not... I, 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 I don't think I'm defined by, a, by one thing. You're a natural modeler, would you not say? Right, I, yeah. right for sure, in yeah. terms of NLP. I, I enjoy that. Yeah. I enjoy modeling. Uh, 25 years later, we built a house. I'm not a builder. <laughs> You know, I've, I've modelled someone else. I was very interested in it. I got interested in hypnosis and NLP for other reasons. But what brought me here was the, was a desire to learn something, essentially. Because, I mean, Lagos was a very undeveloped place 25 years ago. Oh, it was wild. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was wild. The wild it was, West. It was great. Uh, I mean, the to, frontier. Well, yeah. Imagine this. When I came in, not only did I not uh, swim, I, mm. I didn't drink. Wow. And I'd never been high. Yeah, you've learned both since, I, I guess. I, I, I just I got introduced to loads of surfers, so in some sense, I got in, t in touch with this uh, other yeah. other tra other intelligence that was yeah. like, "This is called being stoned. This is called being drunk and yeah. stoned. This is called sleeping on the beach." And wonderful journey, wonderful, mm. wonderful trip. And so I now find myself still here, still learning. Mm. You know, not so much surfing. I mean, you always learn surfing, but I've, I've I learn other things. I learn how. To, do woodwork here, make chairs and furniture and learn how to be a builder and learn how to and be when, a husband. When he, when he says he learns how to make chairs, we're not talking about just any chairs here. Yeah. We're talking about the most detailed, amazing chairs you've ever seen. <laughs> I you, hypnotise you. Yeah, really just no, no, here. no. When, when, he, when you were telling me, I was like, oh, okay, he's made a few chairs. And then he showed me the chairs. Went, oh, wow, these are incredible. We, I mean, we can do a podcast on furniture in itself. Especially yeah, on, on Sam Malouf. Uh, Sam Malouf, yeah, who you modelled. Check him and out, And you yeah. make uh, replicas of his, uh, his chairs. Is that, yeah. is that a correct? Yeah, 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 absolutely fantastic, amazing, amazing cheers. Maybe I'll uh, I'll put a picture up in the in the podcast and they cool, can see. Cool, man. Yeah, what thank I'm you. Talking about yeah, go on. So now I've, uh, as I say, I'm now learning, uh, and I've been involved in the learning practice of having my own hypnosis business, which I operate from my house, and I see people. People call me up and say I want to stop smoking or I can't do this. You do I'm online like, as well as uh, yeah, I also, yeah, yeah, do stuff online, uh, which is cool. You know, it's like watching a movie. Really, some people go, does it work online? I'm like, have you ever seen a movie and been scared? You have less body language to work with. Yeah, you do, but yeah. I mean, ultimately, that's that's the analogy I use. Have you ever watched a movie and really not liked a character or been scared or been upset? Yeah, you know, consciously, they're actors. It's not real, but when your critical faculty again is turned off your unconscious mind doesn't know if it's real or not, so it gives you all the states mm. that it thinks are appropriate. So in terms of you don't have the same body language, but the person that's doing it, if they understand rapport, you can you can still achieve rapport on a screen. Yeah. 
there's certain things that I probably wouldn't do online, but um, I've done a lot of it, different different people, different countries, and I still go surfing. Um, every now and again, I have a go on my skateboard, mm-hmm. and uh, I, I certainly still make furniture because we still need a bit more. So my whole thing for coming here was to learn something, and really interestingly, I still am learning here. But well, what's what's your um the, the philosophy of life that you have in the way that you express your creativity, your desire to do different things, you know, in the fact that you have got these multiple interests, I'm similar, mm-hmm. right? you know, you, you have got a way of expressing yourself either th- musically or, or visually through the chairs or, or now kind of psychically through the, mm. the hypnosis or, yep. you know, kinesthetically through the board. Yep. You know, what, 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 what's, your, what's your kind of analysis on uh, why you live life that way? It's a good question. And <coughs> sometimes my wife's asked me that and uh, other people in my life have asked me. And I think realistically I can... I don't, th- I don't think about it. Mm. A great deal I don't have a plan or a philosophy or a way that I think I want to live my life I've I've been lucky and I suppose luck is not lucky you create your own luck don't you my friend got me a hat once the harder I work the luckier I get I don't yeah. actually believe that so my philosophy for me really has been I'm gonna I'm gonna do what I want to do and when I want to do it but what do you take from because I, I guess you know with surfing, for instance, you are in the moment. There's no future, there's no past, you're in the moment. Right. When you're making chairs, as I've done a bit of joinery and yep. stuff, you're in the moment, right, aren't you? Right. Everything else just disappears while you're focused on this. And That's right. Same with guitar playing. That's right. Yeah, and it's, you know, is there something in that you think that you, you gain like an enjoyment from? Is that you can... Like, without a doubt. And that's, if, if you're in that, if you want to um, codify it... Yeah then you could, f- for sure, that those metaphors are not lost. I'm very much like, this is what I'm doing, yeah. and this is the only thing I've ever done. Until I go, oh, now this is the thing I'm doing now, and this is the only thing I've ever done, I've ever wanted to do. Mm. So for me, definitely, I do spend, as in NLP, it's a perceptual first position. I, I am in the moment a lot. Mm. Now, so there's not, there's not a, you know, I think William Blake, the, the poet, said something along the lines of the palace of wisdom leads to the road to access yeah. or ruin or something like that. Yeah. And, and I believe that's true. If you're always, so my, I always say the way I live in my life and I've lived my life and been in the moment, done what I've wanted to do is not, it's not an archetype. Cause I think if you're not careful, you can ruin and waste, waste your life. Mm. I've, I've somehow been able to pull out, at the right time, so to speak, you know. <laughs> like, okay, enough. So yeah, no, perfect amount of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Funnily enough, I don't have kids either, so. <laughs> you pulled out at the right time. <laughs> I, there, was a t- there was a time when I knew that it was right to stop being in a band, you know. There was a yeah. time when I knew it was right to, I don't know how yeah, But you what. still play guitar. I mean, I play more than I did when I was a musician yeah. recording music. I play more now than ever. Like, yeah. It was an incredibly important part of my life, it still is. Yeah. I love music. I love guitars. I love playing guitars. Oh, okay. Well, just we're talking on that topic, mm. you've just been to England, yeah, to see Tool, yeah, Smashing Pumpkins. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah amazing. So, so what was that like? Uh, it was. This is my fifth time of seeing Tool. Yeah. Uh, and I went with a friend that actually introduced me to Portugal, ah. with and his son. And his son had never seen them, hadn't seen many bands. So his second or third band was Tool with his dad and like, like uh, I'm not his uncle, but you know, I've known him since he was born. So that was just absolutely mind blowing to sort of look down at my mate's son, who's no kid and he's no, he's in his thirties and just go check out Ossian <laughs> and Ossian in a full hypnotic state, yeah. just looking at tall going. So that was just be- a beautiful couple of days. And I stayed with them and their family uh, that have known me throughout this whole trip. And they used to come and see me, Perry, my mate used to come and see me when I was in a band in London. Right. So, uh, the Smashing Pumpkins was, was a band I was always into in the 90s mm. that I missed seeing and thought, oh, well, that's that. And then they decided to reform pretty close to the original lineup. Same venue, same week. 
So in terms of, I just couldn't believe my luck. You know, I was like, holy fuck, here I am with the two of my friends. Two, yeah, two gigs in one Two weekend. gigs like at the O2 with two bands that mean a lot to me, with two people that mean a lot to me that's oh, still in my life. Wicked, yeah. And their families. Yeah. And from there, we actually went to stay in a place called Suffolk in Woodbridge, where there's this great big archaeological Anglo-Saxon oh, dig. What's who, um, Sutton Hoo. Sutton Hoo, yeah. Yeah, yeah went yeah. and checked that out. That was... So Anglo-Saxon uh, burial? Yeah, 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 yeah. They made a great Netflix movie about it called oh, uh, right. The Dig. And actually being on that side. And that was kind of a side I had no idea that would... All of a sudden, I was like, right, I'm going to start modelling archaeology. <laughs> I'm going to be Indiana Jones. I'm into this. You're going to be digging in long. I saw you look up as yet. <laughs> you never know, man. Because uh, yeah, that's, a, you know, the whole idea of the gig, the gig experience. I mean, that's got to be like one of the ultimate hypnotic things that you can put yourself through is, you know, the way the music works, the light works. The yeah. last gig I went to see yeah. was uh, Roger Waters in Lisbon. Cool. The, the Wall. Uh, no, he did. Uh, he did the mixing his solo notes. album a year ago. A year oh and a yeah, half yeah, ago. yeah, 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 yeah. Right, it was yeah. just. I mean, I've seen him before. Right? Yeah. I've seen him a few times. I've seen Pink Floyd and stuff. But it was just such an amazing gig. I had a few mushrooms as well. Oh, only, only enough to tickle me, right? Only enough to tickle. <laughs> amazing. But, yeah, but but it was. Um, you know, you, you, and you think on those terms. You think about the spectacle. Yeah. Right? And you know, this guy's. Late seventies. What genius! Uh, but putting that effort in at that age yeah. for his audience—I mean, the, the unbelievable amount of work that goes into a Roger Waters gig is just phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, and uh, but it was like, you know, what is actually happening here? You know, this, what kind of state is he putting us in? With you know the Insane. the whole the whole um, you know sensory overload yeah. uh, experience because he definitely puts political messages within his music because I think he's more than aware that you know the audience is in some form of a trans state you know sure. and that gives him the opportunity to you know say things that maybe he wouldn't normally be able to say yeah absolutely without subliminally being. as well in the well, he, he does the play as well. He does the, the, the he does like the, you know, it's like the parody within, within a parody of like how the Nazis were able to use the same levels of, um, you know, trance and hypnosis for for the masses, and yeah. you know, it was it was powerful. Yeah, yeah good, good. Uh, the net, I I couldn't get tickets for that, and um, I'm pleased you were there. Yeah. But if he ever comes to Lisbon again, you let me know. Definitely. Vice versa. But he said it was his last tour. It was the farewell tour. But they do a few farewell tours, don't they? Yeah. This is my third farewell tour. I might do one more. <laughs> I hope he does because yeah. uh, I saw the wall there uh, quite a few years ago. What a concept! Like, yeah, you, they a actually build a wall up, mm. like just insane. Mm. And the whole, you know, the start. You did you see it? Did yeah. you see the wall? Like yeah, the whole, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the brick stock falling out. And the start is yeah. like the end. Yeah. The start, like a World War Two plane comes from the back and blows up, and there's a neo-Nazi rally, and they're yeah. all, all the hammers, and you're like, this is. The, the first song, what's going on here? Well, it, 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 Pattern interrupt or what? The Second World War, I mean, if you want to talk about someone who's trauma-based, right. right, is that is that um, he, he's bitter, extremely bitter, <laughs> but that his father was killed um, in the Second World War before he got to know, know him. Right. And that kind of defines his entire artistic output. He's still talking about it today. Mm. He's 77 years old and he's still talking about it like it happened yesterday. You yeah. know, and that's, you know, basically what colours his entire, you know, um, his entire way. So that but was useful to him? That was useful to him, yeah. So he's used that. You don't want to... I can I can help you with that trauma. <laughs> What's my, my, Michael Carroll call it the the the, F, the FO pattern? Yeah, well, have to fuck off that. <laughs> <laughs> I want I want that. You yeah. know. Yeah. Cool, Matt. Well, listen, Matt, uh, I'm going to have to call it to an end as much as I don't want to, but yeah, amazing conversation, really fantastic. Loved every minute of it. If people want to find you, and you know, that's what I meant to say is that if. Um, Matt is one of the coolest, or is the coolest hypnotist I've ever been to see. Awesome, you know, really, really fantastic. If anyone's uh, wanting to try some uh, hypnosis out or want to, you know, uh, have a chat to Matt, where can they find you, Matt, if people want to contact you? Thanks, man. I, I'm, you know, I live in Lagos. My website is, uh, let me remember it now, uh, Algarve, hypnotherapy.com. Algarvehypnotherapy.com, one word. And I live up by around the um, Mayor Pryor area. So if anyone wants to come, if anyone is interested in hypnosis for themselves, or I also do work. I'm a mentor for the NLP Academy, where they where we spoke about the training happens here now once a year. There is information about NLP and learning NLP. Uh, any of that's all on my website website algarvehypnotherapy.com. And there's an Instagram page as well? 
Uh, yeah, there is actually. I've got. A, I do an Instagram page. It's not a great deal to up to, do, to put on it. So every now and again, I put a uh, post on it, and it's a Facebook group or a Facebook page. Okay, it's all Algarve Hypnotherapy. I'll put all of the links in the description below. Uh, awesome conversation. Thanks so much for coming in, mate. Appreciate yes, sir. That. I was going to do the old interrupts <laughs> on you then. <laughs> Drop you into your mic. <laughs> cheers, oh, Loz. All right, mate. Cheers. Thanks, mate.